we got episode three, right? Episode three. Yeah, episode three. Right? Cozini Bros. Chef Corner in the house. Uh, let's see. We got Master Butcher, Mark Donitis, personal chef, entrepreneur, grandpa, father, <laughs> you know, everything in one bag, man. You know, so uh, welcome to it. And, thank you. Uh, thank appreciate you. Appreciate your time uh, today. Uh, no, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Was, uh, this is a, an incredible gift and yeah. Uh, receiving a lot of gifts uh, the past couple of days. You know, yesterday we had an amazing day in, in um, over at Sweet Baby Ray's Kitchen and doing some culinary butchery demonstrations, which oh, yeah. is, for me, it's it's fun. <laughs> Keeps me out of the office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, no, really, the opportunity to have uh, contributed and, and made an impact in some way in my years as an educator and having years as a chef and talk a little bit about the journey, I guess. but. Uh, you know, when you make a, a, enough of an impact or an impression and, and, um, and receive the gifts, like a, a, a set of knives with your name on it, that's, uh, yeah. that says a lot. And I'm really honored and humbled to be here and share my story, slices of, of the uh, proverbial chef life, if you will. Uh, yeah. And uh, so thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, those knives do look dialed in. And <laughs> shout out Pam and uh, Forest Awards for those knives. Yeah, because, thank you. Um, though they came in looking really awesome right there. We got... What is that? A 10 inch wood handle chef knife right mm -hmm. there, the new quantum knife? Yeah, mm -hmm. Solid. Any solid. chance you could hold it up so we could see it on camera? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And, yeah, and you were just cutting some stuff. Nice over edge there, there, yeah. We were cutting some uh, salumi, which we'll talk about. That's kind of my real passion. And, and some of the things I do in my free time outside of my, my, uh, my, uh, my employment uh, as a protein specialist yeah. um, for uh, Performance Food Service uh, Denver. Uh, which allows me to serve as some kind of a specialist yeah. now. Um, and that was, it, it's interesting now as, as being called chef, I'm really not in a kitchen, but I kind of am. And uh, that's been a unique journey for me over now three decades. Yeah. Uh, graduated Johnson and Wales University in 92. Um, I went to culinary school at the, at the suggestion of my father, not so much telling, he didn't tell me what to go to do. Um, upon graduating high school, I was supposed to go to Los Angeles you know, be the next uh, rock star heavy metal band. I was a lead vocalist as a kid growing up, musician. And, and um, that translated well later because while I didn't go on, on tour and on these stages, I've been on educational stages. And that's a huge gift to, to be able to um, still do your passion um, and just without kind of some of the <laughs> things that uh, are, you know, going to Los Angeles and being in the heavy metal scene back in the 80s, 90s yeah. or what have you. Yeah. To, attributed to so i'm very thankful for, for my father saying you know go to school for something you like yeah you know yeah. just don't be a crap head you know yeah yeah um, and you started and with this chef right i mean you had a knife in your hand probably at the age of five pretty I much i mean we did it time. yeah we did it not professionally mm -hmm. uh, my family came over uh in 56 uh from italy came through ellis island and, and into massachusetts my mom's side so you're second generation so i'm second i'm second generation okay. my father came over 56 my my mom was born here and uh, they were uh, Calabrese, uh, where my father was more uh, Pugliese or from Matinata. Okay. And my, and my mom's side was more from Calabria. Um, so I grew up in an Italian, you know, Italian immigrant neighborhood. That yeah. Shrewsbury Street is known uh, for its uh, Italians, basically, yeah. during the 100 year migration, you know, late 1800s and such, when a lot of uh, Southern Italy started coming over after the war and whatnot. So, yeah. and it was interesting. I worked there later after I graduated Johnson Wales, uh, Denver. Uh, sorry, not Denver. I taught at Denver, yeah. <laughs> uh, Johnson Mills, Rhode Island. Yeah, uh, and again, graduated in '92. I was fortunate enough. To, I did my externship. That was one of the great things about Johnson and Wales was opening doors. Yeah. Um, there's a great, solid foundation they they provide you as a as a core curriculum to function out uh, out in the world, the fundamentals, if you will, and then the opportunities from there are, are you know impactful. Um, my mine was at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach, Florida, five star, five diamond historic hotel, um, and it was to meet and exceed guests' expectations. That was simple motto. Love it. I was 18 years old. <laughs> I was like, I want to go to Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> I'm in this kitchen, and <laughs> I had some experience that summer. Uh, I, I took a job as a, a prep in a bakery. Scandinavian bakery of people call from all over New England would come in up from Connecticut, Rhode Island. And then uh, Peach, that was his, his nickname, and there's mom, mom who looked like from the, the lady from um, the Golden Girls, the, the Sicilian mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She kind of looked like her, and then yeah. it was 
Big Tony. Big Tony was the delivery driver. <laughs> Big Tony. And, uh, Classic. But, but they made Italian sliced Frankie bread. Frankie the leg breaker yeah, was the yeah. guy. Yeah. No. Stop by they, what you say. <laughs> but he would do all the delivery routes. They had all the retail business. So I did that five days a week. And then on the weekends, uh, and this was my summer in between in between going uh, from high school into college there and whatnot. And uh, and on my weekends, I had an oversands permit for my Bronco. and go down the beach, down at Race Point, and uh, we'd get on the pier, we'd go fishing for squid. And I did that growing up as a kid, just for ourselves and for bait. And then there was a guy who had a pickup truck, he lived out of the back of his <laughs> truck, and he had a dog with three legs and a patch on his thigh. <laughs> and he was there, I mean, it's, you're like two in the morning, you're on Fisherman's Wharf, there's, there's guys coming in with tuna boats, and there's like tuna coming up on a hook, on a tow truck. Wow. And then they just drive off the pier to who knows where, and then wow. who knows where from there. And so there's this guy, this he says, hey, what are you doing with that squid? I says, oh, I'm going to eat it. And, you know, he's like, eat it? You guys eat that? It's bait fish. It's <laughs> Italian. I, says, I bring it back to some of the grandmothers. And, and he says, you want to sell it to me? I said, yeah, sure. What do you got? You know, it's like a buck fifty a pound, as is, right off the... I was like, okay, cool. Wow. I paid for my gas money. You know, I'd get a steak so I could have steak and seafood, surf and surf on my tailgate. out. On the, so we'd drive out 3 a.m. onto the beach. And you, you needed a camper to stay over unless you had a line in the water, of course. There's always a way to... And as long as you had a line in the water with square bait on it, you know, that you were good. So yeah. the ranger would come by, he'd check on things, and you'd just go on at night and catch some bluefish, catch some striped bass. You had to be a legal size limit. That was big back then, of course, yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so this is like while, while you're in college, too, right? No, yeah, so and is, through, what, through so college, is, yeah, because I used to have friends, and we'd go yeah. up in our free time and take them to the beach. I mean, we did a pot of baby bluefish that we caught off the pier and some red wine, and it was like a sangria bluefish boil. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, out on the dunes at like 6 a.m. or whatever, and, you know, we'd go out and get fresh cohogs and clams and have chuck them on the half. Oh, you yeah. know? And, and for the people yeah. that don't know at home, Johnson and Wales, chef is being modest, but Johnson and Wales is the number two culinary school yeah. uh, in the nation. So yeah. like his foundation combined with the, you know, you know, uh, your family history yeah, family. is just, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't, again, we weren't uh, restaurant people. It was just out of nature. You know, they came over, my father and my, my, I remember my grandfather, they would, lived in the three deckers up on Mott Street, which is another a similar neighborhood like Shrewsbury Street, but different up on the hill. And, uh, you know, my great grandfather, they'd all play the cards out there and sit and they'd always had a 22 and they'd pop the squirrels. <laughs> and then literally they, they had the railing on that back porch. He'd nail the legs to the, to the wooden railing and then he'd take his buck knife. It was like a little mini meat processing center. Wow. You know, and they'd wow. go for pigeons and, and, uh, what do they call them? Sunfish or yeah. or whatever. And, yeah. You know, so they did my father, his uncles and whatnot, they'd go fishing. And, yeah. And when they first got here. Things, of course, they always had big gardens. And so I grew up around gardens. My mm -hmm. grandfather planted like a thousand tomato plants. And then every Friday when he was done with his masonry work, he'd go and deliver them to the retailers and sell them. I mean, yeah. Farm to table before it was farm to table. And it yeah. wasn't farm. This was urban backyard. They bought yeah. some property and he, he grew stuff on it. Because when he was in Italy, he worked in the vineyards and knew how to. So we had a wine and you know, I became acquainted with wine at a very young age. Yeah. Uh, it was the, always in a jug in a very large house they had purchased in some land at one time and they, you know, in saving or whatever, and then ultimately signing the land off for future generations, kind of how it used to be or whatever. But the opportunity to go to college was um, awesome. And it was, I was inspired by my junior high teacher, Martha, uh, Miss Mulcahy. Nice. Uh, we were known as the breakfast club. <laughs> First period class, <laughs> breakfast. And my favorite was the egg and toast, or egg, the uh, bird's nest or yeah. whatever with the fried I egg. Love those. And that was fun. And we called the breakfast club because literally when that movie came out, she talked to the principal and somehow uh, we were able to watch the breakfast club as part of the class <laughs> in the morning. So that was kind of interesting. Added to the free. Cool. And, yeah. uh, and years later, I always resonated about that. You know, I, I remember you know being, again, I wanted to go into music. so. I had the long hair. I had the, you know, dungaree jack with all the pins. Yeah, we got to find one of those pictures. We gotta, I know there's, <laughs> there's a picture oh, there's somewhere floating online. online. We got to see that. Um, but no, I remember this pin, and it was a, I had gotten it at like a Cumberland Farms or 7 Eleven or something like that. It was one of those pins that said, I want it all. It said like blue glitter or something like that. It broke yeah. up with all the heavy metal pins mm. that was on there or whatever. Yeah. And that always resonated as, as something to come back to over the years. And, and she, she, uh, she was uh, kind of a, a, a sort of a mom to, to folks and whatnot, in a sense, you know, and, and really took some folks, some of us under the wings and helped uh, guide us and give us a, uh, good advice <laughs> 
from making bad, not making bad choices, making better choices. Yeah. Right. You know, as, yeah. As a yeah. young and it was fun as a teacher standing in front of students and reflecting back and knowing that, hey, you guys, I was where you were, you know, 15, whatever years ago. And so don't try and pull one over on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I used to jokingly say, I'm the one that your grandparents warned your parents to warn you to stay away from. <laughs> I said, so think about that for a minute. Yeah. I says, no. And it was, it was really, um, and, and that was to kind of help break the ice, you know, um, recognizing that you have a lot of um, young adults uh, trying to figure out what they want to do. And now they're in a room with a bunch of knives yeah. and either a whole chicken in front of them or when I started teaching shortly after the meat cutting curriculum, I started teaching that. We started bringing in like half carcasses yeah. and stuff. And that's pretty intimidating. And that's when you first got introduced into, because you were breaking down large proteins before that. Uh, yeah, so, we, yeah, I did it from a hotel, you know, and it's interesting. So I left Johnson & Wales in 92, having done a three month externship at the Breakers. That was fantastic. It rotated me throughout all the different departments. They had a butcher, they had three butcher poissonniers. I mean, it was a true brigade. It's what they talk about in culinary school and what they tell you to learn. And they're like, nah, don't worry about it. When you get out of industry, you're rarely going to see that. Right. I was fortunate enough and so grateful to get not only get my externship at the Breakers, be successful with it, yeah. and then be invited to come back in 93. So I uh, left, I graduated in 92. I went out into industry. I did. Um, I worked over in Italy in my paternal grandparents' hometown in Matinata. I saw the two apartments. They grew up across the street from one another. I met an individual who remembers my father, so it was cool because he was the first. I'm the first one of the first born, yeah. as the namesake. And to be back there, um, I worked at Trattoria de la Nona in Matinata, right on the water. I ran uh, the grill station. It was a wood fired grill, and we do grab locks from scratch with pine and, and rosemary shrubs. We'd go up, take the daiatsu. Uh, with Chef uh, Nicolo Magnifico. He was the chef of um, Hotel Faraglione up on the, on the cliff there, just a couple little bit out of uh, Matinata yeah. on the way to Vieste. And so I did a couple weeks there, and then I stayed and did uh, some time at Trata de la Nona. I cut bruschetta, uh, tomatoes for the little brunoise uh, with a steak knife. Mm. <laughs> We'd serve 200, right. 250, or whatever. Yeah, yeah so, and, and that was just to break in the Medigan. Yeah. <laughs> and it was fun to have those exchanges, even though they didn't think I knew you know, how to speak Italian or some of the words that uh, in English they didn't know. It was fun to <laughs> banter back and forth. And it was great. I mean, I worked, you know, we worked uh, six days a week. You'd go, you'd, you'd start your day at eight in the morning. I'd have some some uh, quadruple or uh, six espressos and maybe a little a little sip of Sambuca, mm -hmm. help round it out and then go and work. Yeah. And you work into a lunch and then pre somebody's des designated to prepare lunch for everybody and you sit down, you have a full four course meal for an hour at noon. Front of the house, back of the house, yeah. you sit down. The family meal, right? It's very mm -hmm. nice, you drink, you drink red, you drink white, it's casual, it's, you know, and then you clean up, you go home for a little bit, and then you come back at three, you stop prepping again for the night and the stations and all that, and, and then you go until about midnight, 1 a.m. Yeah. When you're done, you sleep for a little bit, and then you start all over again the next day. You do that six days a week, and they were closed one day. Yeah. And I stayed with a woman, um, Pasqua and Domenico, her husband, who watched my dad and his brothers while my grandfather was their way at war, not fighting for the American side. Um, and my grandmother had been sick. They were up in Asti, you know, up north, where my father was born in Asti, but they were from Matinata. So it was very uh, interesting to, to be be there and understand the deeper, greater history of, of our people, not only here, but to be where, and I've been to Calabria too as a kid when I was wow. 10. Yeah. And that was an interesting experience. And some people don't get to, you know, do that, Chef. No. You know, like, you know, actually yeah. spend time in your culture yeah. and actually get to know, mm -hmm. you know, the roots of where you come from. It's like, it's, it's very beneficial, yeah. obviously, you know. Yeah. yeah so. I, I could have, I could have probably stayed longer and I should have stayed longer. I yeah. chose not to and I came back too soon, but mm -hmm. it happened. And I ended up coming back. I was working at uh, Worcester Polytech uh, Engineering School in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, I was on uh, uh, the dinner shift, basically, feeding 650 students scratch. It was about 70% scratch cookery, and for back then, that was pretty good. It was Deca Corporation, so kind of like a compass group yeah. or a year mm. after a flick. Yeah. Uh, Deca Corporation had some different com restaurant concepts, Deca International, and then they also had food service, so it yeah. was college dining. And that was great, 
you know, a lot of people are like, go to college dining, yeah. be a freshman. No, it was, if you didn't know how to manage a station, I mean, I had two six foot grills. Yeah. I had like three quadruple fryers yeah. and you'd be running grilled cheeses using a, a paintbrush roller, like yeah. with the butter, <laughs> you know, butter yeah. or whatever, and you're rolling and, yeah. and you've got those going and you're running all the fryers and then you're making sure that the food in the holding pattern isn't going beyond its holding proper time yeah. and you know fulfilling the needs of the uh, student workers who were in the line positions yeah. and things like that yeah. i remember chartwells was, being in there yeah chartwells was on point every it's day a uh, great company you know. it's an amazing <laughs> yeah. job for somebody yeah. um for organization you know and six and and again 650 people it was myself and one other cook usually sometimes there was a banquet chef there but he was focused on banquets yeah you know that's that was his thing and there was two of us Rare, sometimes it was a third just as a rotational in, but and then on the weekends, it was myself and one other, and we would do brunch uh, for 450, because a yeah. lot of students went home and such. So it was- You got summer and winter breaks though, right? Yes, yes you got right. the lulls, yeah. and you do other stuff. I mean, yeah. I worked, I worked, uh, I mean, I've always had a, started as a paper kid, you know, yeah. delivering papers. Yeah, find something else, um, keep yourself busy. Exactly, and uh, other things, and I, I worked in a, uh, what do you call those, uh, we sell plants and stuff, <laughs> garden shop or yeah, whatever, you yeah. know, Spazato's a, a, a flower shop or something like that. So I do all the plants, yeah. and, you know, the dirt and all that. So I was always doing something. I worked yeah. in auto body, I uh, did auto body. And uh, when I wasn't doing that, I think one of my favorite jobs really was uh, masonry. Like my grandfather, I remember being with my grand. My grandfather passed away in 78, I think it was. And uh, I remember being by his side on a couple of projects. Yeah. And, and building the stone, I mean, just kind of sitting there. What was yeah. cool was he, he was part of doing a cement insignia for Worcester Polytech. Oh, wow. That sits up on one of the main buildings. Yeah. He was, they sought him out to help with that specific thing. So to work there and all that. Yeah. And it's nice because when I go back home, I can go drive by these spots and say, that's, that's, that's a piece of me. That's yeah. a piece of us. We did that. We and, then, and then in my late teens, after I did auto body, um, I was a prep, co you know, car prep guy or whatever. I mean, we did like, old old 38 limits and yeah. different things like that they had like 10 layers of paint so you know, <laughs> with a mask on <laughs> yeah <laughs> grinding down to the steel slat you know and, and it was interesting to do and spray and all the wonderful chemicals that you get to work with yeah <laughs> yeah and with proper yeah, protective yes. gear of course yes. right yeah uh, and then I, yeah <laughs> and then i got into working uh, for some uh, other italian families that had um, businesses you know independent businesses construction um, primarily masonry yeah. That was my passion, building walls. My father built a lot of walls yeah. um, for his own personal thing. He did a couple walls on his own and ran some projects. But um, I got that. <clears throat> uh, it, and it's interesting because it's like culinary arts in a sense. But yeah. the rocks speak to you. They tell you where they want to go be put. I mean, I've used cement, but I really like building freeform walls. Yeah. And the rocks, it's ch -ch -ch and it sets itself. It's like Tetris. And it, yeah. <laughs> and it's like music, too. You yeah. get these, these runs where you're like going on this tangent. I can I'm, I can write and all this stuff is flowing and it's the same with the rocks. The rocks tell you where they want to be put. If they don't speak, then you gotta leave. Them. I like that. You know? Now at this time, chef, like was you know the the culinary side just taking you know not a back seat, but was that kind of you were focused on the masonry? So you were so yeah exactly. You weren't As working teenager, in the kitchen at this time. No, like I wasn't you were working just in the kitchen. I enjoyed working outside. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm Southern Italian. Yeah, I I, I love being in the sun. Um, I. You know, my, my SPF is negative 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but no, it was great because I worked outside. Yeah. I mean, I was like 17, 16, 17, making pretty yeah. good money hourly, but I'm outside lifting stones, like yeah. big stones up and over my head and into a dump truck or out of a dump truck. And then, you know, we'd have mixed cement mixes, but oftentimes you do with your hands and things like that. So your, your forearms get, uh, yeah. <laughs> I get work. And what's so you inspiring. you had those Popeye forearms yeah, the Popeye at one point. Forearm, yeah. you know, you know, and, <laughs> and what's more inspiring is, so, you know, you work with, with a couple different generations and, you know, one was the uncle, he was like 85. Yeah. And Still doing, land. just oh, picking yeah. up stone. That grown man strength got. is a real thing. Yeah, and yeah. and then <laughs> another one who was just a little bit smaller, kind of more, I don't want to say wiry in a bad way, but the, the strength and just determine, and you know, you're in the summertime and, and that's the thing. So I wanted to, that's really, I would trade my trowel for a spatula almost any day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just love being in the outdoors. I love the fact that I put my hands on stone yeah. and lifting and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then more importantly is, is seeing it yeah. years later. Yeah, and that's cool. Uh, that's and again, when I go home, I get to drive, and I've shown my kids and 
son, daughter, whatever. I built that wall. Or, hey, that's the wall that Grandpa built yeah. when I was, and I remember, see, that's why I was sitting yeah. right there. Yeah. Like that, so. uh, but yeah, you know, so Connor really wasn't on the radar until yeah. my father, you know, figure something out. I'm graduating high school yeah. or before, and, you know, he stopped sending grants in. I received a grant from, uh, or a, uh, a, uh, what do you call it, a grant from my mother's bank, it was Shawmut Bank or something like that. You know, you write an article. So you do those things. Yeah. You apply for different things. Mm-hmm. And then, through college but yeah i was never on the radar it was more how much to be music and yeah and whatnot so go the breakers really really set the tone for me and that was like wow yeah this is this is what i want to do um so and then they yeah, introduced to the like you said the brigade like the french brigade yeah system, the classical you, brigade system yeah. and new they put me and i told them i was very green yeah and i told them i was green i wasn't going to try and have a chip on my shoulder and play yeah. it off because you'd get mm-hmm. <laughs> and quick you oh, know? Yeah, absolutely and yeah. uh i had too much too much integrity for that yeah and, um i mean years later you get a certain sense of confidence but uh coming out of school you know I, and i and the breakers was great for me because i was so impressionable and you know a historic hotel like that and the, and the clientele that are there and just the simple fact again meet and exceed guest expectations and yeah. it's like wow and and to perform at that level uh, consistently mm-hmm. and the expectation of that daily um the, the chef matthias matthias raditz i think he was in his 30s and he had already been there for a number of years he's austrian a chef he worked in the islands i think and mm-hmm. he brought some of his guys with him the exec sous chef show me some they had uh, him and a uh, guy ended up being a roommate with um uh, had come up from pier 66 in fort lauderdale i think it was and um so i mean i was introduced to a lot and, and that was the thing so i did my externship three months yeah did the rotation the exec sous chef who mm-hmm. was also the the uh, externship coordinator so you had oh, okay. johnson yeah. you had cia you had some you had some really skilled and, and, yeah. and hard working guys from pica or pica or whatever pittsburgh culinary yeah. program um i still stay in touch with some of those old line you know the guys you, you, yeah. get, you there's you a get, rivalry between crew. cia guys andrew and uh johnson and wells yeah. guys because johnson yeah. wells is the number two cia is number one yeah. um in hyde park new york so yeah. like we always battle with those like there's yeah. always a constant rivalry between yeah. us yeah so and yes. yeah you know it's fine because I've, I've had people joke with me about yeah. that and you know there's certain things yeah. they say and I'm like, ah, just i'll google me yeah exactly <laughs> tell tell me who's what how, what what did they do for you versus yeah. what johnson does either did for me and it's really not about the school at the end of the day it's about the individual yeah what you take yeah. from the program and what you do because after this i mean after you know your externship and you stayed yeah. on this is where it finally came like hey i, th- I think i'm gonna do this yeah you know, and i think i'm gonna really yeah, get into this exactly yeah. and i i knew going into it i did not want to be in a kitchen the rest of my life right i knew that was just one piece of where i wanted to go what i wanted to do where i wanted to, i had no clue but i knew that this i was going to dedicate a, a certain amount of time to and immerse myself in it and that's i have always immersed myself in everything for the good and for the bad yeah and whatnot and um you learn and you grow and those those times that you persevere through and and see you don't know exactly what it is and that's okay but know that focus on the moment yeah and yeah. and that's really and give it your all and everything from there will, will come naturally i've yeah. always been a, aggressive and and strategic in my in my uh, career, not necessarily knowing exactly where I might go sometime, other than knowing that I might need to pivot. Yeah. Or, I mean, COVID, obviously, that mm-hmm. was a huge pivot. But going back for, for that, you know, I knew eventually I wanted to get executive chef. So I left school, um, I came back to the Breakers to, to work for them. Mm-hmm. Um, after coming to, you know, working in Italy, I came back. Uh, I helped open a restaurant in um, West Virginia, uh, Elkins, with some people I had graduated with. Um, that was a really fun opportunity to do, working at a bar while still, you know, opening a new restaurant, yeah. things like that, just making it happen. Um, that was an awesome experience. Um, and that was kind of a, in holding before I got back down to break or so. Okay. My externship supervisor, uh, he's kind of, I kind of fondly call him my, in, my first industry dad. Yeah. Um, you know, who was a significant impact. He was more old school, yeah. you know, and that <laughs> that old school chef mm-hmm. and for good reason though i mean you know yeah. um i looked up to him he had a great deal of experience and i knew i could learn a lot from him and, and uh, he gave me an opportunity to come back down and um so i worked at the breakers west country club uh, i kind of came down as a chef tournant 
specialist, if you will, or hitman, yeah. or you know, point and shoot guy. So I run, work all the different stations. Yeah. He knew that my experience at the hotel and just that I was aggressive and doing whatever needed done. You know, yeah. um, it would get done. Yeah. He could put that trust in me. And, and this uh, is chef. If like someone doesn't show up, like, hey, I need you to work garbage. Hey, well, hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, That's for today exactly. And, uh, so yeah, we were open in the kitchen for a season day one. We opened the brand new uh, the kitchen downstairs. Uh, and then the full dining room upstairs. So uh, we had two people call in. Um, and I remember yeah. <laughs> I called Chef and to see if he needed to ride in. He's like, you know what? He's like, just go straight in. He's like, you have an open time card. Mm. I'm like, why, what's up? He's like, well, so-and-so and so-and-so called in. It's just you, me, and Enzo, and maybe the dishwashers if they show up. <laughs> so we're opening up the brand, you know, and, and so like for the first yeah. month and a half, it was just us three. And then our, our stewards cranking out. I ran the upstairs line. Like my upstairs line is as long as this here to the wall. And I had one of those long French decks mm -hmm. and I'd have 20 omelet pans, 25 omelet pans going. I'd yeah. have the grill work and burgers and, you know, basic lunch stuff. Um, and that was to do, I did about 100, 125 coverage in the morning. Plus I put up before that, you'd put up and staff meal for the for the grounds mm -hmm. people um, each day out yeah. of that kitchen. And then, you know, once you were done running the line a la carte, putting together cold side, you know, and doing just running the line and putting the tickets out, um, you finish with that, you kind of get your meats together and then you get that pumping out for the banquets. And then oh, you got that Sunday brunch popping up. So, yeah. I mean, it was just a constant. I was doing like 16 to 22 hours yeah. easily without batting an eye. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I'd sleep for a little bit because, you know, you got all that restaurant energy and <laughs> and you have a, a, a beverage or three, uh, <laughs> you know, down there. A bar, you know, the, the South Florida bars are open at 5 oh, yeah. a.m. And, and um, that's in our industry uh, on a, one of the things that's an outlet or what have you. And years later, you can only you can only do that so long. Right. Um, but um, and you know, there's many that get kind of caught up in that uh that yeah. cycle we yeah. you know we see that a lot towards, exactly. i mean because what do you you know you're you're working 12 mm -hmm. 16 hours yeah. and then you get off at 11 o'clock there's only so much to do at night yeah and then you yeah. oh, i gotta wake up and uh open up the kitchen so exactly. how, how no. do you because i mean how, how'd you days. break away from that chef how'd you like hey that's i gotta chill out yeah no <laughs> um you know and it was days where you'd be you'd persevere through and you'd be like god if like crap you go in the walk in every little couple oh, yeah. seconds you get you're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, just power through it. But for me, anyway, um, it was bodybuilding mm -hmm. um, and fitness. Yeah, um, I had begun to look. I remember. I remember uh, the uh, uh, what was it? The White House's initiative for working out back in during the Reagan years or whatever. And they had the physical fitness book, or maybe it was Bush first Bush. I remember, but it was this physical fitness book that they yeah. had. And it was basic whatever it was kind of i think black and white car cartoonish looking pictures yeah. that were of that day you know and uh that was inspiring you know i was never athletic like sports yeah. sports was not my thing um i tried little uh minor league i tried little league little league i was the kid who like i got my one of my first hits i was not great at baseball okay and i got one of my first hits i ran to first base like mad i'm like yeah and i went and dove and slid in the first oh and everybody's like did, what are you doing? You can't slide in the first. I'm like, what do you mean I can't slide in the first? What the kind of crap is this? You fly, slide in every other, but what's the, you're like, you can't do that. I says, I just did. Yeah. Am I safe? Yeah, but you're not supposed to. I says, whatever. You know? Um, Got to run through it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but no, really, uh, fitness, you know, yeah. physique and all that, that's one thing. But it's not so much about the physique and, and the look a lot, you know. It's, it's more about your, your health. Yeah. In your mind, it's it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a lot of discipline growing up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gave my mother and father a lot of gray hairs yeah. and whatnot. And unfortunately, li I lived through a lot. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, fitness has always been been something. Even to the extent of I want, I became a certified personal trainer while I was working in in, yeah. in Florida. So I was at the, the Breakers West. I did a year uh, as a chef tournament, and then sometimes when it was slow, I rode a seventy two inch mower. Mm -hmm. out on the grounds just to make up for hours uh, when golf, golf yeah. wasn't such a priority. So, um, and that was wonderful. And that's, you know, and I'd always hit this gym and there were some very inspiring people that owned the gym and I embraced that whole thing and I plateaued. 
And that's where it, for me, it was like, I might want to make a career change. Right. And fitness for me was like awesome. Uh, there, Cause there were some people who had done Olympia uh, at this gym in uh, West Palm and uh, to see and be, a, be around that, just like being at the breakers when I was 18 yep. and seeing what's possible. So I became a, you know, I went through the IFPA international fit, fit, uh, professional the IFBB? IFPA. I, oh, the IFPA certification, International Fitness Professionals Association. Oh, okay, okay, I got you. Um, through the gym, the gym owner, he was like mm. an international barehanded, uh, fisted fighting champion or something crazy like that. He trained at feds and the Secret Service and all that. And, um, so he was off in the program there, and I went through and and uh, in hopes of having something to step away from food because I plateaued at one thirty five. I was super shredded. I yeah. wanted to compete and. Um, um, but working in kitchens, the last thing I wanted to do was touch food. <laughs> yeah. And I have to clean up and do all that. Yeah. So it was like, this might be an out for me. And um, obviously, <laughs> years later, uh, um, so I left the Breakers for a position. Uh, so I went from the, the Breakers West Country Club over to the hotel. And I worked primarily at Fairways Cafe, which ultimately turned into all of um uh, Flagler Steakhouse. It was on the night. Is it still in Florida? That's or still in Florida. When you came That's to in Palm okay. Beach now. That's okay. still in Palm Beach. So, was there kind of as a as a um, uh, PM PM chef or whatever PM line cook, yeah. you know, line guy, and then also chef torn on duties uh, yeah. throughout the hotel. So, if if we were set in the casual fine dining, which was across from the beach club, you know, sometimes you go support the beach club for their brunch. They do five hundred thousand covers or whatever, and, or you go over to the main kitchen. And, help with the, in the stock sauces area, you go into the butcher room, you go into Garmage, just wherever you were needed. Yeah. When you weren't doing your regular stuff, you were, you would go out. And it was like, uh, it was probably like three of us guys that they used that for specifically. Yeah. And this is still in your, your twenties too, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I was 20. 22. So yeah, I was still about 22, 23. And so I was, uh, there from December 93 to December 95, mm-hmm. the used to break. And, so with the group, so a year at the ho- a year at the country club, a year which round was nice to see the tennis and the golf and all that, and, and then do private in home parties, right. and then go back to the hotel and, and you know do all that. So, oh, so you're just like still in grind mode at this point. Still in grind right? mode, you know, just so, picking up yeah. hours and getting as much experience, and you know because you, you knew the guy ahead of you was gonna yeah. either mess up. <laughs> and and some of us were going to call them out yeah because that's just that's how it, aggressive it was on the east coast for, yeah for oh a lot yeah of the, you know most culinary positions definitely. And you, you know yeah and and so um you know you're always striving for that next thing yeah. and somebody either chose to leave up their own accord or they messed up enough where you called them to the mat because they were, yeah and, and it wasn't we never sabotaged yeah no, no we weren't that bad yeah but there were people who would yeah yeah, definitely you know, been in kitchens where that happens. Yeah, yeah. Cut yeah. try to yeah it, and that's so it was an impressive two years, and then I found a job through our Johnson Wells hi- yeah. uh, Higher Line, the mm-hmm. Career Development Office. Yeah, and it was a job for a guest ranch resort and conference center up in northern Colorado, and I was like, wow, that's far away. It was twenty miles from town, five miles down a, a graded gravel dirt road, and um, it was. Uh, it was what I felt I needed to get out of South Florida. Yeah. I think I felt I had capped out. There was a position open that I, they brought in somebody else. They didn't promote me. Chef felt I wasn't quite ready for it. And that's respectful. Yeah. And, and that, getting back to Chef Matias. So when I met him on my externship, uh, that's kind of when I got interested in the mustache. He's a young guy, <laughs> yeah. kinda got a, a, a very similar round face and a super impressive smile. He was yeah. just so jovial. And I was so impressed because he was only like in his 30s and he's chef of this grand major resort and, and so he always had this mustache so yeah. the month i left um i had i had gotten employee of the month that that month and then i gave my notice so we're in this room and there's still the different departments and we're sitting there and he's going you know they go around the room and talk to the different departments who had got employee of the month and he comes to me he says yeah and short shit here he's He's leaving us after getting employee of the <laughs> employee of the month. Uh, he's going up to Colorado or something, and and and, and everybody just kind of smiled and laughed. He's like, no, he's and you know he kind of said some really nice words, and yeah. it was a good send off. And and um, a couple of months later, um, we found out the person who had gotten the position um, uh, kind of in the breakers. You can understand, and you know, with your yeah. background in fine fine hotels and, and things along those lines, there's a certain level of performance that you have to. You just yeah. have to. 
and you either can or you can't. Right. And, and that's okay. If you can't, that's fine. No, it is what it is. Yeah. But the, the individual they chose, I think he was about two months in and he went over to the hotel to go get the breads from the, the bakery department, fresh every night, whatever. And he never came back, left, yeah. his, left his knives. Yeah. And just walked. And there was a couple instances of, of people yeah. who would, you know, sit. There was one chef, I remember, I think he, during the middle of service, I forget who, when, it was before me, I wasn't there, but went, sat on the seawall. Yeah. And just looked. No, I've definitely seen it. Yeah. Just broke. Yeah. Uh, just the stress. Yeah. Like the high, you know, strenuous hours. Uh -huh. And sometimes people just, you know, not, not snap, but yeah. just break down. They do. Like, you know. Yeah. You know, and so it was, I mean, you had, it. you had, you know, Kings, queens, presidents, yeah. celebrities. Uh, I think Mary Kay's property was on the far south side of the Breakers Hotel property. She wasn't part of the property. I mean, that was, you know, kind of, you know, and just that that whole yeah. thing. And, and for me, it was very interesting to see at such a young age and, and understanding and embracing the fact we're just servants. Yeah. You know, depending on what realm of the rung of the ladder you're in, you know, you either have, in, in all due respect, I don't mean this in a bad way, but you either have a plastic name tag Mm -hmm. Or you have your name embroidered in your in your coat, yep. and and I learned very young that you just kind of look, yes, chef, yeah, and and made it happen, yeah. And so it was natural to for me and my progression and whatnot. So when I left, I called chef. I says, hey, chef, how's it going? He's like, good, good. I says, hey, I started growing my mustache out. I I, <laughs> I, uh, I want to be like you. So what 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 mustache wax do you recommend? <laughs> he's like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> I says, uh, I understand uh, the chef or whatever, you know, we're catching up. He's like, yeah. I says, see, chef, you should have just kept me. Yeah. <laughs> and it happens like that. Um, but no, it was really, and I, it wasn't in a, a spiteful way. It was really yeah. jovial. I, he was really impactful, as was uh, uh, Jean Michel Matos for me at the Breakers as well, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, set a, a certain tone and of getting things done. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I was. Uh, December 95, I left Palm Beach, Florida for Granby, Colorado, north. It's, uh, Fraser is, was known as the icebox of the country. Yeah. Uh, the whole month of January 96, it was 30 below zero without wind chill. Mm -hmm. um, it was cool. I had a manager's, you know, had a nice little cabin. And uh, had, uh, uh, we had guests coming through uh, summer, winter. Winter was a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, summer was constant either it was either a three three day stay package or a seven day stay package so there was always a rotational cyclical menu or cyclical to the sense of there was a structure for it but the way i developed it was allowed enough flexibility for me to to you know be creative yeah so there was you know there was breakfasts were a la carte there were some that were buffets same mm -hmm. with lunches and then dinners there was three plated dinners with you know three entree options and appetizer salad course and it was nice it was elevated stuff like i was doing yeah. in florida um and then it was also just you know good solid food i mean one of the things was like a fried chicken that was a prepackaged frozen chicken and we had guests that actually complained about the really fancy food <laughs> like we want what some of the staff is eating and i'm like okay yeah, yeah sure and i didn't take offense to that i'm like yeah no if we need to diversify the menu to serve our customers hey that's fine right they're the ones again I, it, service i'm a humble servant we're in the service industry and um when you embrace the realities of that and truthfully um in service to customers and things like that especially at those capacities and then you think about really service industry yeah our our lives are stressful in a kitchen and yeah and you start hearing that ticket printer going but oh yeah you know you <laughs> have emts you've got paramedics you've got police you've got military folks who are under a a, a much grander stress yeah. um respectfully speaking so that's what helped put things into perspective is this is a kitchen and yes we need to com execute at this level but comparatively that's what brought me back to reality in, yeah. in, in keeping it calm. Not to say I wasn't a one of And one this of those. is where you branched off into the, you know, the culinary instructor, because you were yeah, in Colorado, I was, and then that's yeah. when so you were training. So being at the ranch, uh, yeah. we had a lot of um, college age yeah. uh, kids for summer jobs, you know, and for some of them, there was a lot of people with no experience front of the house, back yeah. of the house. Maybe they worked in the cafeteria or in college. But so that's when, for me, I had to have, even for my cooks, 
my sous chefs, we, I had systems and procedures. I had checkboards, checklists, breakfast, lunch, dinner, potatoes. And at this time, I learned very quickly that uh, <laughs> potatoes cook differently at elevation, oh, yeah. 9,500 feet above sea level than not. Um, yeah. Uh, but no, it was, for me, that's really when education started thinking because my, my training, my regiments for my kitchen was set in a way that was like a classroom to a degree. Um, so it was now, so I was there for about two and a half years. I think it was 96. There was a book called The Great Ranch Cookbook that I got a half page picture in and a uh, nice little bio as part of the write-up of the ranch amongst other West, Southwestern and Mount Rocky Mountain region uh, ranches and such. Uh, when Ashley Walters out of Scottsdale. Yeah. Um, that was 96 that came out. So um, in 98, I left uh, to go to Houston um, and that was a whole different ball game. Um, it was a four star, four diamond hotel in the gallery area, Post Oak, uh, the manor house on property was actually, uh, George senior and, uh, president George senior and, and Barbara's home, uh, the manor house and it became, yeah. you know, it was like a club private members thing. And then they could get it. There was a lunch that they offered and it had its own chef and then they would do private events in there. And then of course there was a hotel. I came in as a PM Sue, um, the uh, banquet chef had, or the, the chef de cuisine of the dining room had elevated to banquet chef. So I was kind of being brought in to replace him, but they had like three sous chefs that rotated out. So I was PM, sous, uh, a, we had an AM, sous, and then it was kind of a mid swing. And then within about two to three months, you know, I kind of elbowed my way to be the yeah. the chef de cuisine of that and, and that spot. And, um, and so about six months in now, um, I saw a clipping of an article on chef's office. Um, uh, they were opening uh, two golf courses, Houstonian Golf Course, which was an amenity to the hotel club members, mm -hmm. uh, corporate clientele, and et cetera. And then there was a little cart path um, about 200 yards maybe with Shadowhawk. That was a private club, members mm -hmm. only, 100K to join, 3,500 you know, yeah. membership dues monthly or whatever. And member number one, former President Bush Senior, Barbara. Barbara loved my egg salad and chive sandwiches. <laughs> um, uh, Mary Caraba, I think Craig Vigio. Yeah. There's a lot of oil and energy. And, um, so I did a year at the hotel and we did things like, uh, there was one during the energy conference, we hosted the four heads of each of the African states and their entourages. Mm -hmm. We did a dining room, ballroom tent yeah. on the grounds outside the hotel. So the level of execution every day is oh yeah, you know, it's a hundred percent there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's yeah. no ninety nine percent. Yeah, okay, no. this has on. to be perfect. Yeah, like, no. everything has to flow. Yeah, um, you know. So it was, and it was different. Um, I was introduced to a different style of chef. Yeah, uh, chef Jim, Jim Mills. Uh, he had been at the Houstonian already for a while. Uh, he he was out of Beaumont or something. And I, he <laughs> he went to Europe to hitchhike uh, uh, in Europe for a while mm -hmm. and after. Uh, high school or whatever and he came back wanted to be a chef you know he took he was yeah. completely but he was different in the sense of his management style was more human i mean i interviewed for a pm sous chef position a combination over two to three days 10 total hours of interview time yeah he interviewed me the exec sue interviewed me and then you got to do a practical at the end. Uh, basically. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, you know, I was like, wow, this is cool. And they said, well, we want to make sure if we hire somebody that it's a good fit, not so much for us, but for them out there in, on the floor. You know, um, as we know in our industry, it's, it can, can be a revolving door. Yeah. And, you know, again, working for a four star for diamond and the clientele that they cater to, they want to make sure that it's the right individual. And so very fortunate to have gotten the position and so I saw this paper clip in there for this uh, golf course thing I, I popped my head in the office and hey chef yeah yeah I says uh, so what do I got to be the, be the guy for this yeah. <laughs> what do I got he's like well you're already a candidate you're you know one of a, a handful of folks and um, he says you just keep doing what you're doing with that um, you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and he says these are some of the key things you need to work on over the next couple of months so that when the time comes that we start selecting then you would have already worked on it. And it was impressive. And he was, as I said, one of the cool things about him, he, he, his management style and philosophy was very human centered. It was about the individual. And, and that really helped me kind of further my management style in the kitchen that mm -hmm. translated into eventually what would be when I went to teach 
yeah. at Johnson and Wales. So um, I ended up being the, the guy mm -hmm. uh, who, who was the opening chef for those two clubhouses. I got to edit. I was 27. I wrote the menus inside a double wide trailer office. <laughs> and, and, no, really. Yeah. And I would go through literally one of those big, big aluminum pots of coffee a day, yeah. yep. literally. And I was typing out menus and I, I put all together all the reception packages, the breakfast menu, the din lunch menu, the dinner menu, the reception, the banquets for the each. Both clubhouses were separate. I mean, Shadow Hop was elevated, a little bit more elevated, etc. cetera. And um, finally time, came time to uh, uh, try the recipes and, and execute the dishes. Mm -hmm. So we're about a month out from opening and such. There's still, I mean, it was a dirt up build and all that. So we're at the hotel and, and chef says to me, uh, we're gonna go into this. And he says, I'm gonna tell you how this is gonna roll. He's like, the ones you nail, it's all you. He's like, the ones you don't nail, I'll, I'll take that. I'll say it was my thing. So we did the presentation to yeah. you know, the, the owner of it was Redstone Credit Union, Houstonian, Houstonian Golf and, and, then, and then the CEO, CFO. And, uh, the owner's son, and uh, so I stopped putting out the plates. It was the first time I, I executed it. Yeah, I uh, hadn't made it other than in my head, and um, everything went well. There were two things in particular, and one he couldn't cover for me on was the Boston baked beans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, chef chef came in. He's, he says, "So the uh, cornbread, cornbread." He's like, "We got to change that." And I was like, well, "That's the break. It's like Breakers Hotel. This is like five star five time. What do you mean?" And, He's like, just trust me. It's a Texas thing. It's not that it's bad. <laughs> yeah. like, and he says, and also, um, they told me to remind you where you are. Uh, we don't serve Boston baked beans in mm -hmm. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, chef. Yes, chef. Barbecue um, baked beans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, nailed it. I mean, we did desserts. I did all the different, and, and we really nailed it. So for me, and uh, cooking has always been visual. Mm -hmm. To the extent of actually, I probably hit about 85 to, I think it was about 85% success rate on the dishes as they were, yeah. and as they were served, as they were plated. There was some that were like minor tweaks, but from a perspective, and for me, that's what helped me later on in life, which I'll circle yeah. back to, but, um, you know, doing that was awesome. And so we got the thing open. I worked like 72 hours straight for the first opening of the clubhouse. Oh, yeah. I got to spend like 250K mm -hmm. just on flatware, china, glassware, uh, things like that. I mean, Schaefer, the chafing dishes was like, I think they were 1600 a pop. I got, I got a little discount because I bought so many of them for like 1400 a pop. Yeah. The orange juice urns were like, you know, 900 a piece. Yeah, people don't like realize that. just the atmosphere. Like when you're at that level of dining, yeah. like I, even for Michelin star, uh -huh. Andrew, like you're, you have to have paintings on your wall yeah. that are over 10 grand. Yeah. Yeah. The paintings on the wall yeah. have to be that price. It's, it's, it's really, yeah. it's really interesting. And I mean, again, it's, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. I'm like 27, 28 years old. Uh, we opened the first clubhouse opening was in October of '99. Yeah. Uh, former President Bush Senior George there. He came down the hallway. He's looking at. We had this ice carving of a go rotating in the center of the of the yeah. bar, and there was uh, green underglows of these gra uh, tufts of grass. And in each tuft of grass was a, a tin of caviar. At the time Beluga, when it was still available, it was yeah. twelve hundred for the tin, and then uh, Serbuga. Osetra, those were each like at the time, I think uh, 1100 or something. And one was like 850 yeah. for the can. The ounce, yeah. And then we had that American stuff. <laughs> uh, but that, Jordan, he was like, he was like lazy. He kind of looked, we introduced, you know, we said, welcome to your clubhouse, Mr. President. And chef was with me and the GM of the hotel uh, was with me as well. And um, yeah, it was like, wow. And I had worked like 72 hours. Yeah. My, uh, <laughs> yeah. It was fun. It was, uh, and, and there was a couple of associates there, uh, uh, Chef Miguel, who I still talk to down in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, he was my exec shoe opening, and I still still stay in touch with him, elbow to elbow. Nice, and nice. it was a hard, you know, you know being yeah. in the kitchen and whatnot, you get, you go to the, you go to wharf, so to say, yeah. and you have your, your soldiers, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta have your, uh, your proper tools in there. Yeah. I've seen some, uh, some things go down about knives being, <laughs> yeah. being in certain places and oh, like, yeah. hey, that's my knife. That's my shine. Yeah. That's my, yeah. my Wistoff. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely have to have the proper tools in there too. Yeah. Especially when you're executing, I mean. The, the robo coops, the can openers, like yeah. you have to have actual Everything nice is, equipment mm -hmm. in your kitchen and it has to be, you know, serviced and running well. So and um, everybody that's where we come in, right? Exactly. You know, with Cassini Brothers. So, yeah. yeah. Come in and deliver. It's, you know, you have to have a sharp mind. 
You have to have sharp knives yeah. to execute yeah. time and time again and be on point. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We were talking the other day how a culture of it and how it's basically a closed system in there, right? Yeah. Oh, Everyone needs so. to know their responsibility and have passion in, in their end result. So you guys have synergy in those kitchens. And, and you have to be able to lead those folks in a way that just like in a classroom. So this is again, where his management style transcended into the, my management style of, yeah. the, of, of the mission of the hotel, the mission of the, of, uh, of uh, uh, the Houstonian was to be legendary, Yeah, you know, and in everything you do. And I had to, extrapolate out on it. It's like running out of the NFL locker rooms. Yeah. 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 No. And you, you know, putting your name on it. Yeah. I mean, putting your name, you know, whether it was Matias Raditz, it, it wasn't when you're a cook. Yeah. It's different, you know, cause you're putting that chef's name on there and you have to embrace that. It's not about you or your opinions. It's about the chef's name yeah. Yeah. to a chef's office had on it, the exactly. breakers. It was rule number one. Chef is always right. Rule number two, yes, when chef. the chef is wrong, yeah. refer to the rule number one. Yeah. You know, and, and, and just yeah no yeah. it's um and to be able to le get the buy-in from people yeah and so opening to executed well we had about probably 90 percent retention of the staff there was mm -hmm. a couple of temporary staff we had to hire to get through i i told them i was like no we're going to work them through the contract i want them there they're that they're that willing yeah. to and they're that good and they can grow um, yeah, so that was good leadership and you, you know, you create that, you know, that good culture. That's the I've thing. been in, I've been culture. in some kitchen ship where it's just in three months I already knew. I'm like, all right, yeah, I got to, it's I a bad vibe now. Yep. Um, and it's not that people, you know, people want to stay for people yeah. that treat them well. And you, you forget exactly. how, like just saying, Hey, how are you doing this morning? Hey, how's like, you know, checking on them mm -hmm. as a person, as opposed yes. to, I yes. just need you to cook this. Yeah. That's all I need you to do. No, it's that you know? human approach. So, and that's really what, yeah. what, thought of me more as as I progressed through and you know I hit had a plateau uh, where there wasn't any at the time there wasn't more any opportunity within the Houstonian to grow there were some other per things percolating but there was no immediate things for me to progress to like say a corporate level chef or yeah. multi-unit things at the time it just wasn't there so it's like okay and then um, my second daughter was being born uh, in 2000 um, so prior to that, I saw a, a thing in the newspaper. They're open in a campus of Johnson and Wales. I saw yeah. Dean Griffin was the opening dean, mm -hmm. for, you know, a culinary uh, director or what have you. And I was like, oh, that guy was my Garmage instructor in 1990-91, freshman Garmage. Yeah. He was only like maybe his early 20s. And so that, again, was one of those impressionable things. He's, and he's, he's like a walking encyclopedia. Yeah. That's another one of my, so you, got, you know, uh, definitely uh, James Griffin is Dr. Griffin. Uh, is was impactful and, and, and so I sent up a resume. I said, "You probably don't remember me. I was a long-haired kid, you know, in, in freshman year, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Yeah. And so <laughs> I remember getting on campus, and they were still a lot of construction going on. Yeah. And I remember stepping out of the car. I had my jacket, my white jacket, pressed, you know, T in the back, yep. uh, tight white. I had my apron was pressed, and walking. I had a little suit briefcase. My father had gotten me. It was a little alligator a crocodile suitcase from yeah. South America. And uh, I remember I had my, I had a packet of um, a couple years worth of specials I ran, special menus I did, you know, nightly specials, lunch yeah. specials, and just what it was. And, and I handed that to him and we started talking. And, and, and he's kind of casually looking through, through the pages of all the different foods and whatever and cuisine styles and menu vernacular you know, yeah. it's, it's it's an art form yeah. you know it's, it's, and this time chef were you known as a you know a master butcher being your no, first thing yet no that even, was it yeah butchery didn't even come into the game okay. until i started teaching at johnson and wales okay um and it came out of so being hired at johnson and wales i was uh, primarily teaching the product uh storeroom class yeah product product mm -hmm. identification mm -hmm. purchasing procurement and things yeah. along those lines which for me is one of the most important things if you if you don't know yeah. that as a chef then you're just going to be a cook you right it, it, you know you have that's the getting out of the forest and the trees and understanding the intricacy of what are those on shelves they're not products that's a dollar sign sitting on the shelf and right. it's up to you to effectively manage that dollar sign coming in the back door whether it's sustainable all natural organic or or commodities or commercial or whatever at the end of the day the sky high view is yeah. product is purchased, it's stored, it's prepared, it's, you know, hopefully safely yeah. <laughs> and all those exactly. other things that go in with that and put on a plate and put into a customer. Yeah. And and that whole process, it, it was it was great for me having, I mean, I was only 29 now, 
coming out of out of industry mm -hmm. to teach and two perspectives one of being fresh out of industry i was i was hiring people yeah and so from that perspective i thought to myself all right as an instructor what is it i need those students to know for that curriculum yeah. but also those things that would tie that experience back. So what was relevant? You know, yeah. what, how, and so I always often referred and pulled from my experiences in industry and, and was able to deliver that in a fashion. My classroom was very structured just as my kitchens were structured. There was yes, always- it was very structured. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. I mean, the day before <laughs> class, I'd, I'd come yeah. to your last class before you came to me and I'd yeah. go to the group of students. I says, all right guys, you know, go to the public folders. Mm -hmm. There are tools and resources in there for you to be successful in my class if you so choose. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I look forward. And then yeah. even that was very structured. I had a yeah. manager of the day or chef of the day and yep. there, you know, team leaders and different things. And I always mixed it up and I always challenged students. Yeah. Uh, you were very stern, but you know, the thing I took away from it, you were always fair. Like you were yeah. hard. Like don't yeah, get me no. wrong. Yeah. It was like when, when I walked into the classroom, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, freezing cold, yeah. meat, meat, uh, meat shave, yeah, you know, shave, yeah, clean shaving, um, you know, take, taking a credit card on your face. Yeah. Go back to the go back to the dorm, yeah. shave again. Yeah. Like, so like Cozini when I joined. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like that. So the, the thing I really big, big, big you know, time uh, that I took away from uh, from your class was, you know, I mean, we're fresh. We don't know. Yeah, exactly. So just to see how to utilize products yeah. by, you know, using using knives like, okay. hey, Jason, this is how you're going to make your money. It doesn't you know, and you can grill this piece of sirloin, but you don't know how to yeah. butcher it. You don't know how to buy it. You don't know how yeah. to cut it. This and then that's what you showed us yesterday on that. Um, uh, the chuck roll right. of how to utilize like getting all this from this chuck and like, hey, Jason, mm -hmm. I just made you. Uh, X amount of hundred dollars. You can yep. do all these little specials with it. Exactly. And just really learn the back end of the business, mm -hmm. uh, especially now because you know the industry's taken a little bit of a dip as far as revenue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You got high turnover, so the really like meat is where the money is. So mm -hmm. you need to utilize as much product as you can. Yep. And when you have a good, awesome Cazzini knife in your kitchen <laughs> coming every two weeks sharp, yeah. it enhances that exactly. and yeah, kind no, of does. you know exactly. stretches that. So no, absolutely, and I think more importantly, you know, people get. To some degree, people can get lost in the in the fluff of the industry, um, the food networks, and all that. Have been a, it's kind of been a double edged sword to some extent, um, for for what it's worth. But at the end of the day, it, it's a lot more than just the passion and the cooking. There's a there's a business element to that, and that was important for me to stress to students. You know, you can train a monkey to flip an egg, and they're cooking, and great, but to be a excel and, and success is everybody's own thing. You know, if you don't want to be an executive chef or business, you know, go beyond the kitchen even, uh, that's okay. Everybody has their place as long as they're happy. No one's better than anybody. Everybody has their place. And, but those things of, of being fiscally responsible, I learned very early on fiscal responsibility. So I was very detailed about, I mean, I was budgeted to run 55% food cost at the Shadow Hawk. Yeah because of the clientele, because of, we had to have this, and this, but really it was, and, but I ran it, I ended up ran it, it was like between 28 and 32 yeah. and whatnot. So being smart and staying sharp and, and honing those skills. Who puns everywhere, I like it. it. <laughs> yeah. um, really, that's, that's, what drive, that's what has to drive a culinarian to go to that level of beyond cooking thank you, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and whatnot. Um, and manage, manage not only people, but manage money that's a huge responsibility yeah. because after that i mean you were really known for you know like hey the chef can teach you how to make x amount of money and yeah. save x amount yes of money. exactly and that's when i saw you started you know after i graduated mm -hmm. i saw i was like man chef is because i always followed you uh doing all these demos and uh, yeah you know presentations and i'm like mm -hmm. that that's it that's yeah. the niche right there mm -hmm. because it shows you how to maximize profit it shows you how to get that food cost to whatever percentage you yeah. need it to be at yeah. uh, and run the business on the back end exactly. before you even open up the doors. Exactly. So. so it was about, you know, getting the students to understand what it is they needed to take away from the class yeah. and, and what as an instructor, what my responsibility was to the industry. I had just gone and I mean, within a very rapid year, I mean, I'm growing up before I mean, that little project at yeah. age 27. Um, is something I did right, I think. And, and I want to extrapolate that. So you take whatever piece of that, ratchet it onto how you can use it and hopefully take it to yeah. whatever success you can and maybe impact somebody else with it. Yeah. Um, and then the other perspective was I was that student, I was the kid sitting in front of the instructor, you know, 15, whatever years prior to being, being mm -hmm. an instructor. So yeah. 
what was it that that instructor didn't do? What, what yeah. was it they didn't do to excite me or engage me more and things like that? And, 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 and reach out, at least reach out for me. I mean, again, going to school is, you have a responsibility to, to, to there's, there's no handholding in life. How much but is the, the same, tuition? How much is the tuition? <laughs> what are you gonna take from me? Mm -hmm. right. Because I have everything to give. And that was yeah. one of my assignments, because I wanted to understand soon, was what's your name? What's your contact number in case there's an emergency? I wanted to be able to say, hey, let's go check on so-and-so. Because, I mean, it's college. There's yeah. a reality that comes along with college. And, and not easy. And making poor choices and things like that. So we were very, very concerned about the, the well-being of students, you know. Yeah. No, um, it was a very personal touch. Each yeah. chef instructor always had, like, a personal yeah. touch with the, you know, because yeah. we had small classrooms. As yeah. Well, 20, 20, 20, up to 20 students. Yeah. It was, like, 15 was, like, a perfect class yeah. size. 20 was great. One to 20 ratio. I wanted class. to engage. I didn't want you to just come in and be a number of things like that. So it was, you know, name, contact, and then uh, why did you come here? Yeah. What what, what brought you to Johnson Wales? What You know, and then, it, and then it was, what do you want to get from me? What do you want to take from me? Over, what do you want to get from the class and for me, the instructor, over the next nine days we're together? Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, what does the word initiative mean to you? That's it. That was, due, that was the first assignment. And then I didn't come back to it until the last day of class when I'd say, guys, thank you. We had just eaten a bunch of chicken wings yep. after yep. listening to Blue Man Group chicken dance song for <laughs> <laughs> on loop. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just saying, guys, I want you to leave here today, know that I'll have your grades together and, and all that results given in and we'll take time to go through the whatever system and you'll see your grades. I says, but I want you to leave here today thinking about that first assignment. Why did you come here? Okay, number one. What did you wanna get from the class? And what did you wanna get from me? Did you get that? Mm -hmm. If you did, Awesome, I hope you got more. Yeah. If you didn't, I want you to think about what the word initiative means to you. Yeah, yeah. And come back anytime. Yeah. You know, there's some students like yourself who I stayed in touch with years later. Um, I was very fortunate at, at, yeah. at Johnson Wales and to have been, uh, had the ability to do other things. So in 2005, I formed an LLC. At the time it was Rocky Mountain Trade Enterprise after my, fa my father had it, was an independent guy for his industry or what have you. He was doing rawhide in South America, Central America, and in Mexico and all that. His business was Atlantic Trade Enterprise. It was an Atlantic trade ship, yeah. you know, the big sales. So mine was the horse and buggy yeah. as Rocky Mountain Trade Enterprise. And then I, it formulated into Denco, which is the Nittis company. Yeah. So yeah. I have a lot of different things. But while I was teaching full time, I was doing consulting for various country clubs. I had a project up in Sterling at one point, Colorado. Uh, uh, I had another project. Then I got approached by the American Land Board. It's on the Johnson Wells campus. The American Land Board was there. There was four chefs from Denver doing some things, and there was a chef talking about something. And I happened to extrapolate a little bit further from what the chef had said to the audience. And, and they, so they pulled me aside. Can you explain this a little bit more in depth after the, the their yeah. demonstration was done? And I says, yeah, sure. I pulled out a dry erase marker and I, I start going referencing the meat buyer's guide, you know, North American meat processes, meat buyer's guide and, and doing this. And they said, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And, you know, and it's like, you know, and, and understanding this part. And so anyway, so it was about two, three weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, chef. Um, would you be interested in doing some some educational work for us or whatever? Uh, you know, we felt we had a good conversation. We're glad you met you. And, and can you review some materials? And they were uh, uh, so my first project was to review uh, culinary materials, and it happened to be from another culinary institution mm. that, uh, yeah. strangely enough, had some <laughs> either outdated information and and just uh, stuff that wasn't quite relevant or could have been more relevant. Yeah. Um, and no, no slam there. It just, yeah. was, you know, just a different perspective that I happened to see and kind of point out having just at this point, I had just started teaching meat cutting now for two, two years. Yeah. And so I started teaching meat cutting because I was, I grew up around hunting and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, from that perspective, as well as seeing and being when I was at the Houstonian, I wasn't doing uh, like carcass butchery. That just wasn't, that's, yeah. that's a very small niche. Even today there's, you know, very few folks are doing that. The ones yeah. that do it are, are excellent, but you know, again, it's it's not, it's not a good fit for everyone. It, yeah. In a perfect world, it'd be great if we could all break, you know break it down and all do that, but it's not practical for a lot of businesses, and that's what we'll talk about: the practicality of business and butchery. And when we got to pay you all a lot. Yeah, no, there's a lot of trend, a lot <laughs> of loss, a lot of, there's a lot of labor, and yeah. just things involved. So, 
taking all that part away, um, you know, was was uh, uh, delivering it in the classroom and then formulating plans for so like the American Land Board, I ended up doing uh, educational materials, something called the curriculum. I was part of a, a larger project that contributed to the cooking techniques for consumers mm -hmm. and professionals. And we started doing butchery, basics of butchery videos, along with culinary cut sheets that associated with it. And then we did one that was non-butchery in 2009. Um, a 15 minute land video, I, I, I wrote the script. Yeah. The script had to be reviewed by USDA, FSIS. So again, you gotta cross your T's and dot your I's. Yeah. I do that every day, Denitis, yeah. D-N-I-T-T-I-S. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, performing at that level again, you know, you have to be detailed. So material was good, got on, I was an on-camera spokesperson, and then, you know, every year after. So 2005 to 2010, I did a lot of work for the American Land Board and then the economy changed and the, the marketing uh, shifted to other right. areas of the uh, segments of the industry and things like that. But I was, was, would be pulled back on occasion to do stuff for the American Land Board. And really they, in combination with my taking over the meat cutting curriculum from a old school brigade cutting yeah. where we were doing subprimals, we we're doing a lot of portion cuts yeah. and things like that. We weren't getting into really the, the technical fancy too much stuff like that, but we were French and racks and, mm -hmm. and doing those basic things, cutting ribeyes, cutting strip steaks, cutting top butts and, and you know tenderloins and yeah. taking the trim from the tenderloin and doing something with it and, and things like that. So it was a perspective from that side rather than so much the meat side, which I'm more heavily involved with now, yeah. like co-packers or salami mm -hmm. producers or you know cut shops and things like that. That, that came a little bit later. So I, I came more from the culinary side and one of my my longtime uh, Carmine Leonardo uh, meat market in Italian deli in Lakewood. They're like my Italian family away from home. And uh, Carm would always give me crap. He's like, oh, you cut like a chef. So <laughs> I said, you know, hey, that's all right. I'll take that. I said, yeah. take that. But at least I don't cook like a butcher. Yeah. And uh, that little, you know, that little jab. Yeah. And um, but it's funny and it makes it interesting. But really, you know, like when we were doing yesterday, I think one of the important points when we talk about culinary butchery and applied skill and things like that. It's more about the business decision. Yeah. And that was what, again, I wanted to extrapolate to the students and the takeaway was, yes, butchery is cool. And if you can do it, awesome. Yeah. But if you can't, that's okay. It has to, you have to have those questions met. Is it fiscally responsible? Right. And does it contribute to the betterment of the business? Um, and, and that's, again, there's no right or wrong answer. The right answer right. is what is answered by you. And it was more about giving the tools to individuals to make those decisions. Again, going beyond just cooking. Yeah, I can show you how to cut something. That's great. Yeah. I can show you how to do this and you can do that. I, I want you to think critically, you know, and approach those those things. In that fashion. What's going to be profitable? Yeah. What's going to, be, what's going to make the most yeah. sense for and your situation? Exactly. Your so, so the things I did outside of school were things that were relevant and I could bring right back to the classroom. So, uh, you know, here I am doing stuff for the American Land Board, educational butchery stuff. Uh, I started, launched a meat company just without my own building. I yeah. talked to co-packers, I worked with them, worked with formulations and I read all the USDA stuff. We'd, in my free time at, at school, I had a small group of students every, every year that, you know, we'd make salami. And it wasn't a part of the curriculum, it was just yeah. an extracurricular thing. And so I did all my testing, I did all my lab work, I did all my, USDA stuff, my HACCP plans and stuff like that through through my time there as well. Um, and that's what you're moving towards next. I mean, we got all these awesome salamis. Yeah, here. That, that's no, something you branched is, out. I branched recently. out and started doing, uh, I never stopped. So yeah. so Johnson & Wales, I was there until 2010. Um, 2006 is when I started my meat company mm -hmm. um, and doing a couple different products with some local co-packers ultimately in 2009. And this is all while I'm teaching full time. Yeah. I also started my own food brokerage. I had, was getting uh, all natural hogs out of um, uh, Pueblo, Colorado from an all natural producer. They were selling at uh, farmer's markets. I connected them with a distributor in Denver, got it to chefs in the Denver area yeah. and then up in the Vale Valley. And just to give it, you know, eight, eight months, um, outside of their farmer's market stuff, just in food service, it was whole carcasses, split hogs, you know, into yeah. the primal cuts, um, and uh, barbecue hogs, you know, on, you know, 650 pound up to 100 pound, and then we we're selling like 250, 300 pound carcasses as well. But in eight months, we did like 25K yeah. at $3 a pound average. Yeah. For I mean, that's, that's you know, again, I, I, I saw the natural industry and all the kind of, all this stuff, I was like, you know, 
I'm going to take this. And it was a beef company, Colorado's Best Beef, doing Charlet. And uh, same thing, I developed one head, two head, three head, four head cut sheets. And this is where I really started delving into beyond the butchery and more on the, on the, on the floor side. Right. What happens when that animal gets slaughtered? And it gets part and pieced out. So we developed a program tracking, you know, one cow, one an or one beef animal, which one beef animal is going to yield X Y Z cuts. Right. And then we do one carcass at a time. We got to find the, where to sell it. And then then there was the stuff you didn't sell. So we created the pallet tracking program, utilizing the meat buyer's guide by detailed number specifications. It had dollar amount, it had this and pallet twenty pallet tracking system like that so you can see exactly and, your profitability yep. from the size what you're selling what, what you have sitting on inventory is yeah. you know what may be your fire sale stuff if, if you get too much inventory and there's not an outlet for yeah. chuck or this or that or things like that about what they call balancing the carcass yeah. um, everybody wants ribeye strips and tenders but that's only a small <laughs> portion of the end you got these big shoulders and chuck arms and yeah. plods and you know you got a whole big round it's uh you need to be more than just a steamship in the hotel world, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and you've been around, Chef. Like you've seen, like you know, as far as the United States, you've seen all these meatpacking plants. You visited yes. these places. I visited. Are you, are yeah. you seeing that change at all? As far as like they're consolidating it and moving it into bigger facilities. No, well, that's just... always kind of been. You know, there's always been big corporations, right. um, and there's a, there's a need for it. There is. Um, like you got your Tyson, you yeah, got your, like, exactly. you know, your yeah, big no, guys. Tyson like does our performance food uh, signature program, the, okay. the Braveheart Black Angus Beef out of the Garden City plant. Um, and it's not their program. The Braveheart Beef, Black Angus yeah. Beef program is mm -hmm. a PFG developed program. Uh, they've partnered with the ranchers and the farmers on the 100 mile radius of, of uh, La Crosse, Kansas and such. Yeah. So um, it's a little different than, but same thing is, so, you know, going from the co-packer view, you know, you've got yeah. all the big, bigger corporations that fulfill the needs of, of the masses. Um, and then you have, especially over the last, probably, what are we, 2024, so around 2005 and six is really when that all natural organic movement started. I mean, it's, it's always kind of been there, yeah. but really from a push. And when they started, you know, when the USDA started using those terms, all natural mm -hmm. and all that, you know, those were growth. They were seeing growth the first, uh, what was it? Three years, I think they launched it, I think in 98, they had started research on it. I want to say in the early nineties from, from, I remember reading up on it, researching it to understand it. But when they launched the first year, all natural segments sold over 200, 250% above their projections. Wow. And then you take that from a sky high level. And again, and look at the trends and the, mm -hmm. the, in a sense, all the, you know, food media and things like that. And that's really what drives business. Same thing with a lot of the work we do with the American Land Board was balancing the animal. You ha everybody wanted racks and loins, oh, yeah. and then you have shoulders. So it's looking at those cuts in innovative and unique ways, and then speaking the chef language. So I saw the opportunity, you know, mid teaching between 2000 and 2010, opening my USDA plant, things like that, seeing a gap in a, in a larger industry, yeah. not just in the kitchen, but you have all these meat companies, meat co-packers. And now you see, you know, it was, it was a simple fact of just connecting meat industry professionals with the chef world. And now you see a lot of these meat companies with corporate chefs. They yeah. help with product development or they have an R&D team. You know, if you went on mm -hmm. uh, uh, with your culinary degree, went on to a nutrition degree, you might go into R&D, yeah. a little bit deeper level and things like that. So we had a well, Chef Stein went into that world. Yeah, Remember Chef, no, Stein? Chef yeah. Stein, Chef yeah. Lothrop mm -hmm. as well. You know, they completely went into the you know, Nestle Corporation. Yeah. Uh, Chef Stein, I think, worked for uh, I forget which hospitality group that has multiple chains. So recipe development, yeah. things like that, health care. Um, there's just so many. That was the other thing about the way I taught was exposing students to what they needed to know, getting them to understand and embrace that, but also understanding that there's so much more than cooking than you can do with a culinary degree. Yeah. And, and <laughs> you know. I was looking at that on your LinkedIn profile. I, it, you got about three decades worth of experience on there. <laughs> I, Clear that yeah, it's just. Yeah, no, I've, I've done more in one lifetime than most would doing five or six. I see uh, sales, yeah. director roles, yeah. chef. I just learned about masonry, um, <laughs> uh, personal training, meat cutter, founder, chairman. Yeah. Um, based on my time with you over the past two days, it's it's kind of become uh, very clear that 
you're most passionate about teaching in those things though. And, yeah. And building long-term relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and, think that's, what's most enjoyable now. Yeah. Having done what I've done yeah. and being able to do what I do on a daily basis. Yeah. 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 Specialists, support specialists, you know, you guys mentioned Johnson and Wales and opening doors. I'm not sure if it's clear to all the viewers yet, but J chef Jason was a student of chefs marks. <laughs> and so, uh, that was at Jay Wu. Um, and we've worked together too as an independent contractor. I had yep. to worked together in Fort Worth during pre COVID and, and uh, did some assignments where I reached out and hired yeah. him as an independent contractor. And whatnot. Yeah, a lot I of side it. missions. Yep. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, why don't you teach us about what we got going on right here? Very cool. Okay. So this is uh, what, what formerly known as Il Mondo Vecchio. That's one of the businesses that I launched uh, while teaching full time, yeah. um, including the first few years it was working with cold packers. I did a uh, duck breast prosciutto. Uh, oh. 2006, the first breast off the drying rack was sent to Gallo family for they were doing this artisan food producers award. The very first duck off the production in 2006 won a gold medal for the charcuterie category. Wow. Uh, Gina Gallo and the Gallo family was there. My father and, and we did this thing, did this uh, dinner in, in uh, New York City. Um, and it was just like, wow. Um, and there's a letter I wrote to, you know, and it really why I was doing what I was doing was just an expansion of what I grew up around. Yeah. I left Massachusetts and home and all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the typical Italian kid who stayed home and lives in the <laughs> lives in my mother's house. So wow, she'd like me to, <laughs> no, no uh, we joke about that. But no, I left home and, and I, I, you know, didn't look back per se, and um, had an eye on a prize. And, and um, that's cool. Uh, no matter what it was, I'd always strive to do the best I could for myself and then those in my immediate surroundings. Mm -hmm. In many senses, it was teaching. But, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 What different type of meats are on this board? So here we've got uh, guanciale and a uh, whiskey, a honey, um, sage, uh, oh. lomo or lonzino, pork loin. Uh, this is pork jowl. Um, these two here and this stick on the far end uh, are from a private ranch chamber, private in-home chamber. Uh, I do some advising on the site in my free time. Uh, <laughs> in your free time. Where do you find that? I have free time. Um, but uh, somebody who has a, a ranch, they, they kind of built out their basement and yeah. they asked me to give some insight on they wanted to build a room. Yeah. Um, so they built a room in their basement that is just dedicated to hang salami. There's a nice sink in, stainless steel sink in there and, yeah. you know, clinical walls. And there's probably a, a, it's about a six by six or six by eight room. Um, probably on one side of the wall, you could probably hang about 500 pounds uh, from the ceiling to, you know, six inches above the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, for personal consumption and educational purposes, you know, um, so there's, uh, you know, it's this is a popular right thing. Um, and then um, so that's from the private chambers. We got the guanciale, which is dried, air dried uh, pork jowl season, sea salt only. This here is whiskey, honey, sea salt. Um, these take about 12, 12 ish to 14 days um, under refrigeration after you kind of put them in the salt and their seasonings to help equalize, to make them safe. That begins the process of yeah. pulling out the moisture and the salt penetrating down and, and making it a, a difficult environment for bacteria yeah. to grow in. Is it Pathogen. kosher salt? Uh, no, kosher salt's okay. A lot of yeah. people use it, but it leaves, there's a, a silica, uh, something in there. I always forget what it is, but it leaves the aftertaste okay. of like metallic-y, oh. especially in, in very delicate uh, items like pork okay. and such. It comes through as very metallic in the finished dry. Yeah. I like to use sea salt. Originally I was using Himalayan, mm. um, but I found this uh, real salt over out of Utah, Redmond sea uh, salt. It's awesome yeah. stuff <laughs> over there. and. Um, it was magnificent. It had like 50 different uh, minerals and the flate, and it just, it really made stuff shine. Um, so you got guanciale, uh, what might be considered a lenzino or lomo. Typically you might use a tenderloin. This happens to be a loin that's been split lengthwise, kind of yeah. like the Manhattan filet, you know, Manhattan filet or yeah. boss filet. Um, so the, and then this is a uh, Tejon uh, Chorizo. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tejon Food Company. This is actually a former student, uh, uh, Oscar Aguirre. Um, He's a veteran. Uh, him and his mom had uh, biz, uh, uh, their family had a restaurant in North Denver for like 36 years. They used to do a lot in the community during yeah. uh, Thanksgiving. They'd feed a couple thousand people out of their kitchen and whatnot. Um, but years later, so over COVID, he came to me 
And he always remembered me talking about salami in class and things like that. And we, we became such good friends and such and, and whatnot and stayed in touch over the years. And he says, you know, Mark, I want to, mom gave me the okay to look at make, remaking the chorizo. I'm like, okay. Um, and I said, tell me how you made it. And he tell me how to make it at the restaurant. You know, you utilize things and you make things. And so like in this instance, there's vinegar often in Mexican chorizo. There's yes. this type of acid component. And so what they were using was the jalapeno juice from the jalapeno. It's like the Ooh, canned jalapenos there in there, which made sense. But in, in in commercial production, there's no outlet for the jalapenos in the can. So working with a co-packer, yeah. you know, and, and again, this is where knowing the meat side of things and saying, all right, let's, what, what do we need to do to commercialize it, basically? So uh, deconstructing it from how they made it and then reconstructing it in a fashion that a co-packer could easily acquire the ingredients, source the ingredients and not be out of the norm and have waste product and things like that. And yeah. There's three versions. There's mom's version, there's uh, Oscar's version, and then there's a kind of a, a, a blank label version. Yeah. Mono, it's not monotone, but it's just different than the other two. And, yeah. and it has its purposes. Yeah. Um, what do we got here, Oscar's? This is Oscar's uh, uh, dried. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. And it's it, it eats Spicy. like a Spanish chorizo. Yeah. Um, and charcuterie, other than maybe carne seca and some of those things aren't very, you know, the whole charcuterie trend and craze, there's not a lot of, Mexican meats. I mean, some garmage yeah. things and things like that. But like you know, it, it doesn't get into the level of quite this. They yeah, do a dried chorizo. It's, I've it's seen my first time green. seeing it on a board, and so I'm interested. Yeah, we'll that taste one. that one last because that's the most pungent. Okay, we'll do vertically. Now these other uh, other two items here. Um, this is a vino pepenero. I used to make this. Uh, it was something we I grew up making, and a lot of the cal calabrese folks in in my area grew up either hung it in their garages, attics, or basements. Yeah. And it's basically a super sot. Um, super sot, I mean, mm -hmm. pressed. These are hung rather than pressed, but the coarseness, the fat chunks, and um, you could do this formula with either, it's basically sea salt, a little garlic, um, maybe crushed chili, and black peppercorns. Mm. And even like super sata, they have the red with, it, you'll see super sata with uh, paprika, a lot yeah. of these two, yeah. and Cal Calabrian chilies uh, and whatnot, and peppercorns. Or you see it done with fennel seed. Yeah. And just fennel, I mean, there's a little bit of pepper in there, but not those big, the big ones that you yeah. see in a regular super sata. So yeah. um, this one is uh, wine and pepper uh, and whatnot. But that was one I grew up very familiar with. So this one here, and then this version of Lozino, this is a little bit leaner loin. Um, was used uh, Texas whiskey on that one, honey. This is out of a uh, uh, commercial chamber for restaurant in-house use only. And that's one of the things I do is advise on um, the making of this stuff. I, so I closed, so I left Johnson & Wales uh, having opened a USDA plant in 2009 while I was teaching full time and then also running that plant daily. They, if the, the university afforded me a, a, a nice schedule where yeah. it was afternoon classes and or late evening yeah. classes. So I'd go down on my plant. I'd, I'd wake up at about three in the morning usually. Um, sometimes my, uh, my my middle daughter would get up, maybe I'd have coffee, I'd watch the news real quick. And, and then I'd be, be off by like four, get to the plant, go set things up, uh, go through production, sometimes by myself or sometimes, I'd, you know, bring in students and whatnot um, yeah. as part of the production morning, especially when it started getting up over 800 pounds uh, a batch run or a yeah. thousand pounds or whatever. So 6 a.m. is start time in the USDA world. You can't pull out a knife or a piece of protein before 6 a.m. because that's there's USDA hours is regulation. So that's the other thing, regulatory. Yeah. It's a lot of detail in, in producing this stuff. So, um, this yeah, is one of our uh, one of our oldest uh, cooking methods too. Like, yeah, preservation. Yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, preservation it basically back. at its best, thousands of years. So I was yeah. I did a method called sea salt only. Um, so I worked with the USDA. I was the only guy, even I think to this day, who's done this sea salt only. Uh, there's a lot of all natural producers. They do some nice stuff. It's yeah. fermented. Yeah. Uh, where there's uh, a heat period to spike certain fermentation, fermentation cultures, um, to get these white molds and things mm -hmm. like that. And then you use celery juice powder. Yeah. Um, which is to fend off botulism and, and, and dry stuff. Yeah. And dry sausages yeah. or, um, you know, make it safe to eat as a nitrite, yeah. naturally occurring nitrite, nitrite. There's none of that stuff. Save the celery for chicken wings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, and so this mold you see here is naturally occurring. Yeah. This is, there's no added fermentation cultures, back to firm or, or things like that. This is just meat, sea salt, and aromatics. 
This is it, originally it's my like company was called Elmana Rose Vecchio. Brands, it was like the that. old world, and it wasn't Elmana Vecchio wasn't a brand. Yeah, it was a lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle that I grew up along as well. A lot of a lot of Italian Americans and yeah. whatnot did. Um, so this was an extension of that. So these two are from 1860 Italia in College Station. Yeah, uh, they have another restaurant, Pochet's Seafood Shop. Uh, Chef Poche was uh, Maggiano's for like 22 years yeah. before uh, leaving, and we befriended one another. And he reached out to me when he left, and he had to wait, you know, a while to before he could open his restaurant. We're in Dallas this, the week uh, the week the world shut down, mm. and we were making a batch of salumi at his house, and and I showed him how to do it. He hung it. He we modified a, a refrigerator, uh, and he we hung about 50 pounds of guanciale. There was guanciale pancetta. We did bison salami. We did vino pepe nero. We did guanciale, and uh, you know walked them through in preparation of, and at the same time, paralleling that is providing the, the uh, HACCP plant. Yeah. So I worked with uh, College Station, uh, Brazos County Health Department, and prior to that, so three years at, at USDA, um, the, I, I, was, I closed. Um, there were some things that the USDA said I couldn't prove. Yeah. They couldn't tell me where I wasn't proving it. Yeah. And after going back and forth, we were shut down. Yeah. Uh, we, sh- we made the choice because we just, that was, it was part of a key thing. Yeah. Years later, I found out what I was doing was just fine. Yeah. And they could never point it out. It was just, this had to be moved over to here. Now, if it was today's standards, but I had a, I sent it to a third party. Company. Yeah. They reviewed it. And basically those three years and, and having it reviewed um, when I closed and then I did so many other things. Um, but yeah, I have, this is three years worth of, 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 of statistical significance under the inspection of USDA for yeah. three years. Yeah. 45,000 pounds of dry sausages yeah. in three years, never a salmonella positive. That's called statistical significance. That's the word they told me <laughs> to, that I couldn't prove. But, so now this, this is the result really. And I, and I never, so when I closed, uh, there were several local area chefs who reached out to me to do their HACCP plans for the restaurants. Yeah. It was like this, but it, it wasn't. It was, yeah. They were doing fermented. They were adding back to farm and doing the more modern American yeah. style salumis. Yeah. And uh, I helped them with their HACCP plans. Chef Justin Brunson, you know, my old major, mm-hmm. uh, Bill Miner at Bill Porcellino now. And that, they started as restaurant locations, even Chef uh, Jose Rosenberg up in up at Black Belly in Boulder. Yeah. Uh, and Nate Singer, who had worked with, with me at the at uh, Rock, Rocky Mountain Institute of Meat, something I found in yeah. the ACF credit, the butchery program, culinary butchery program, and uh, helped them with their HACCP plan. And some of those guys now are doing USDA. Bill is selling yeah. stuff across the US, Whole Foods, and getting distributors. They're so it's not it. that hard to get it on the shelf. It's just a lot of there's a lot processes, of details, yeah, but it's no, not it's, it's not it's difficult. Not, it's a different than a yeah. kitchen. It's yeah. complete, the USDA world is a whole nother level of kitchen that yeah. no, it's it's so it's good to see chefs coming over into that side and doing it themselves, yeah. even at a commercial level. I did it for three years as a commercial level until I couldn't and the USDA, and, but years later they found out that there was a, a thing across the Western United States of um, some overreach. Yeah. Uh, I had Senator uh. Ron Johnson's office reach out to me a couple of years later in 2018 and asked me about something because yeah. uh, somebody told them to ask about uh, my experience with the USDA. <laughs> and had some conversations about what, what transpired and there were some similar patterns from New Mexico all the way up into Montana. But yeah. Respectfully speaking, I shut down, but I never stopped grinding. Yeah. I never stopped hanging. Yeah. Um, at the time, I had Rocky Mountain Institute of Meat. It was an ACF, the only at the time ACF accredited culinary butchery program in the U.S. Uh, one of my students, uh, Jason Noart, went on. Um, uh, he now runs the program, but we were approached by Fort Carson while I was still on there, and we were asked to help develop a specialized survival butchery program for 10th Group Special Forces. Wow. And he's now running that. I stayed on it as advisor. It's ACF accredited. Wow. It's now beyond 10th group to all the other uh, folks and whatnot. And he shows him stuff like this. Yeah. This is the type of survival yeah. stuff I was doing while I was doing the HACCP plans for, say, uh, Il Porcellino and Old Major Brunson and, and Jose and all those folks. Um, I had a microbiologist on my team and we did the stuff for the military program that was like, you know, these are the things to identify an animal while it's alive, if it's been poisoned. Mm. Especially people, they go out and group yeah. eight and 
So you got to think of those things and then what to look for once you start eviscerating, you know, what are these spots, is it what to look for on the organs and things like that, because are, is the village that they're in, is it friendly, is it foam, mm -hmm. yeah. and different things like that. So it was very high level stuff and it attributed, it was nice because we were already doing HACCP stuff and microbiology stuff for the restaurant industry locally, because the health department like put a kibosh on the restaurants trying to do this stuff and for good reason to some extent. Um, it's just a different environment. Yeah kitchen versus a USDA yeah. manufacturing facility. Yeah. Just leave it at that. So, so for folks who aren't familiar with those USDAs, we are, yeah. uh, Jason's probably been there in his chef career, and we actually service a lot of them. Um, highly regulated buildings, Yeah. two yellow parking spots directly uh -huh. in front. Yep. Uh, inspectors show up yep. whenever they feel like it, yep. right? Um, and so uh, foot bath, full smock. Yep. Uh, everything from the top down. Complete different world. Mm -hmm. This gets wrapped up. I probably mm -hmm. yeah. ain't even allowed in the back yeah. these days. So um, again, it's a it, working at that five star five diamond. There's a level of detail that you have to because at the end of the day, you're working in partnership with the federal officials to pr mm -hmm. provide food that is wholesome and fit for human consumption. And that's safe. what inspected and passed is about. Completely safe. Yeah. So after my closure, um, I never stopped hanging. <laughs> never stop making stuff. So I do this um, on the side in my free time. Yeah. I advise. Yeah. Uh, Johnny has at 1860 Italia, Alfredo. Alfredo is his chef, Salumeri, who's been running this program now. And we're introducing new items. We're gonna, I'm going to go down in October. We're going to do a, a batch of that award-winning uh, uh, duck breast prosciutto. Oh, gosh. Um, and do some other fun stuff. Send it my way. Uh, hey, I, well, send I need to go Dallas. ahead and move to Texas. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, chef. So if <laughs> yeah. we ever get into a situation, too, we can have him. He's like, hey, chef, we need to go well, hunting. Yeah. yeah. Break down well, this animal I used to hunt us. again, actually, yeah. west of Houston. And that was fun. But um, so, yeah, so I, I'd like us to, this is Mortadella. This one's not mine. I used to make one. Okay. And that was really nice. But I just brought, the, we brought this for uh, fun and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Little, uh, kind of like a, think of it as a gelato. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So we snapped the magic fingers. We're yeah. plated now. We got all these amazing stuff that we were just talking about in front of us. Um, how do we start it? Where should we um, go first? I know you mentioned the chorizo should be last. Yeah, chorizo should be last. So I used to do this in my you plant. We used to do, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? You never, Someone's already started. Yeah. <laughs> we used to do uh, loading dock Friday uh, when I had my USDA plant. And it was Friday afternoons. It turned into Saturdays as well. So for four hours, I would open at like four o'clock. I'd set out, uh, we had about, I think, what was it? 10, 15 different dried items that I'd. I'd pre-cut and put out on a on a big butcher block to come in and people would come in and taste. And and it was just the whole idea was I remember as a kid in Massachusetts going to visit all these people with well, my grandfather or you know my uncle or my father. We'd go on us, you know, we go here, go there, see this guy, you see this other guy, and you might get something, you know. <laughs> and it was there was one, it was a lampshade store on Shrewsbury Street. And I uh, saw so I guess there's a big demand for Lamp lamp and stuff, go in there and there's a bunch of guys in the suits playing the cards in the back and you know it was uh, interesting so yeah. when when i created el mondo vecchio remember it wasn't so much about a brand for me it was yeah it was about the food of what i grew up with doing and, and when i left massachusetts i didn't find any of this stuff you know so uh, for me it was the lifestyle bringing lifestyle back that i was familiar with so from a marketing standpoint you know how do you tap into that direct to consumer and again this is going thinking of beyond cooking now how do you market? How do you do this? How do you? And so to bring in that that revenue stream, I'd open for four hours. It was simple because I had a clean. We had clean up going on anyway or whatever. So it was just we were there, and I happened to be a, a jug of wine <laughs> off to the side. And uh, when you came and you taste, oh, you need a little cleanser. You have a little <laughs> yeah, pull off the jug. <laughs> and um, well, it was really fun because it was engaging. It was educational. People would come down, and it was like that was the thing. We made it like a loading dock. It's like when you go into go visit the guy and that was the whole thing and yeah. and uh, that turned into a saturday and then and at a time i had left johnson and wales mm -hmm. to focus solely on the business because i just couldn't do both any longer i had i was very fortunate to have gotten the award for the you know gold the duck press prosciutto gold medal award and, and recognition as a chef and doing all this different stuff so i focused on that until we we closed down and when i closed down um it became something as a hobby yeah. And then picked up, and like I said, we're you know we're hanging. We've got a full scale program now in, in College Station with uh, uh, Brazos County Health Department. We worked with on the health department, uh, the HACCP plan, if you will. And um, so some of these are results, and some of these are results of uh, home use. So the first one we'll try is the, the jowl. 
uh, guanciale. Um, typically, you might see that as an ingredient. It's very similar to uh, a pancetta. Um, so you see that fat, the lean, it's from the cheek, basically. So okay. um, that jowl was hung well, probably over a year ago. Hmm. Um, Feels like my beard oil on my fingers. I, <laughs> very oily. Good, though. And usually you might cook that. I did. I call it face crack. <laughs> um, I did some just over the weekend with a, a lobster roll garnish. Um, I rendered out and diced it, made it like cracklings, yeah. basically. And then the or, the renderings, I actually took the brioche uh, buns and brushed them with that and then used that to griddle the buns and then did the lobster in a certain way, kind of like a lobster roll, and then did the cracklings, face crack. So, you know, mm. um, just having fun with food in that application and seeing the uses of these things also extend into the bar as garnish, you know, bourbon, yeah, we were doing scotch, that yesterday when we were fat there. washing yeah. is very popular. So something as you taste that, and the reason you, you taste a lot of multiple layers is that the simplicity is in the salt, one, the salt concentration, but also the methods. There's no other stuff in there other than pure aromatics. There's right. no sort of just powder, there's none of the other stuff. So you're tasting pure pork, pure age, and depth because the salt is mm -hmm. just at the right level. And you can taste layers. On um, there's a lot of commercially produced stuff that's good, don't get me wrong, yep. but it's very monotone. Yeah. It's a it, it's a batter or a whole muscle. There's a flavor component to it, but it's it, it there's not much depth. Yeah. It's very flat. Um this is a lot different, obviously. Um is that because all the stuff that they have to put into it on that on that it's level? To some to degree, and, and to what preserve. the American consumer right. is, and, and you know the fermentation thing is, right. it's to quicken the process. This stuff takes long. I mean, the other part of it was, especially my dry sausage, was at the lowest of all limits of salt content. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, but I had my stuff is a little bit drier, so it's a little bit denser yeah. um, than what a lot of commercial stuff is because mm -hmm. of the water activity level. The stuff is you know 0.85 or lower which at 0.85 or lower, it's no longer a potentially hazardous food. There's nothing that lives in there, no pathogens. And it might be on the outside if you, you, know, you have dirty hands and things yeah. like that, then yeah, that's a different thing. But from a point of it, pathogens being there, they cannot survive below 0.85 water activity level. So this is truly old world, but today, yeah. you know? So the second one, uh, do, the, do the lean, uh, yeah, the one with the fat streak and it kind of looks like a surf wave there. This one? Catch that, yeah, that, no, this one here. Oh, uh, okay. the fattier one there. Just the whiskey one? Yeah, that's one of the whiskey mm -hmm. ones. So this one is from Colorado. This is a private home chamber. Um, this was hung back in April, I think, April 17th. It was started 18 days before that. Salted um, aromatics. Mm. Mm. And you notice how it starts? And then there's some flavors that kind of pop. Mm. And it really starts to taper off. Almost tastes fruity. Mm -hmm. So there's honey in there, a little bit of whiskey, some herbs. And that, that fat content just kind of makes it, you know. Mm -hmm. So about, yeah, 18 days under refrigeration, and it was hung on April, April 17th, if I remember. Um, the next one is loin also, a little bit different section. As you can see, the fat in that section. And you remember we were talking about the pork loin yesterday. Yeah. Kind of the rib end, or the more rib eye. It had yeah. the, the, the separate muscles in there, the spinalis, and, and the fat was different as it went back in the loin, became leaner. So this part is a little bit leaner. This is from 1860 Italia. This uses uh, Texas Ranger whiskey, hmm. uh, honey, uh, chilies, black pepper, of course, sea salt. Um, so I was down in, I, my son and I took a road trip down to Galveston to go surf, uh, surf side and all that, and look at some colleges along the way. And um, so we stopped in College Station, ended up spending uh, like three days there. I celebrated my 52nd birthday there and, and, and enjoying this type of stuff and seeing the fruits of my labor yeah. um, being done uh, in a fashion that was done what I grew up with and passing it on. So, you know, the opportunity to work with Chef Poche and, and his team, and, and he's got somebody who's dedicated to this solely, uh, is uh, is a gift like none other, like I was talking about before, the gift of, so the, these these little treats are, are just that, little gifts of, of goodies and slices of life. Um, so this is a very similar, but different, because it's using 
a little bit different ingredients. And you notice the fat content. The fat's not there like it was in the yeah, yeah. It's in a leaner, leaner cut. Yep. Um, and that would be very similar to what you might find in a if you were using a tenderloin for the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so and you notice the smoothness. It's very a smooth. little bit different. Yeah, but still. But at the end, you get that pepper that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in part, I mean, the the recipes are very similar, obviously. That one was a little bit more pepper heavy, mm -hmm. and that was intentional. Yeah. Um, there's some posts on my LinkedIn page, and I think on my Instagram, um, Facebook, social media pages that show the process of this. It was a little video when we were tying them and hanging them and showing them, you know, whatever, and then along the way. And then the next thing is Alfredo will communicate to me mm -hmm. directly, say, hey, how's this look? Or if he has a question, you know, we created a, a training manual just for the Salubi program, you know, mm -hmm. from the formulas. Um, the flexibility of formulas and this thing is ratios. Once you understand ratios and formulas, then you can manipulate it to meet your own needs. It's just a matter of a little bit more of this, a little less of that, or what have you. And then that way, the method is there. It's like raising a stone. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. And that's why you're just giving them the guideline. Exactly. Like, you can hang this at your house. You can, yeah. Here's the to do it safely. I mean. I've hung this in closets. Yeah. Um, I, we hung this in when, you know, we were doing it at the Houstonian Hotel back in the day. We had a special area within the hotel yeah. that the sous chefs knew where it was. Mm -hmm. And it looked like, um, what was that, the cocoon. So <laughs> you'd walk in and there's like, all these, there's a, 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 a pipe of sorts that we modified <laughs> to make to hang from in a certain room. <laughs> that was, you know, about 50 degrees. Yeah. And um, you'd walk in there and there was like 25 to 50 of these little, uh, we wrapped, tied them in cheesecloth that a typical, there you, go. you know, tie yeah. um, to just help it help with that moisture transition and keep it from getting what you call uh, uh, um, shell hardening, if you will, case hardening. Yeah. And the best way I can describe case hardening, that's where this stuff can get dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what to do. So case hardening is if you, pack a sausage or if you have a whole muscle meat like the lomo or loin or lonzino where the outside dries faster than anything else and what happens is if you can envision taking a pipe filling it with wet cement and then capping it off yeah there's nowhere for that moisture to go and such and that's where danger botulism can come into play in particular with the dry sausage stuff so that's why this is you know I, i've done this for years and yeah. whatnot but recognizing so that before i did it commercially you know, you have to understand the rules and regs because it's, it's people putting stuff in their mouth. There's no, yeah. a, a doctor has more responsibility because they actually, that's the only other person that from an employment standpoint puts stuff in people's mouths. Yeah. You ingest it. Yeah. You could kill people with that. And so it's a very serious detailed thing. And, um, but time tested this particular method, the OG method, if you will, right. um, is that true or world sea salt only dried to a certain level. That's shelf stable. I've got pieces in my car <laughs> literally that have been there for like months on end during COVID I had a bunch that traveled with me through Arizona working out and you know here and I'd pull out a, hey you want to try this like, like no trust me it's all good it's self stable <laughs> you know, I, I have friends of mine who still have some pe who have some small pieces left of the, the last production runs back in 2012 before we shut down mm. and they'll pull it out just like it was right out of the dry room just multiple years later and it's preserving traditions that's yeah. what this stuff that's is good. you know um so getting off track there uh, let's go to the next one there uh which is vino y pepe nero which is or the this this pepper okay. there. um so that is uh red wine and pepper salami uh, that's the super sada version kind of again it's not traditionally pressed they hang these just for uh, production space and things like that this one smells the best mm -hmm. so far not much probably closest to like a salami. Like a Genoa. And how's that tang? Mm. Now, a lot of commercial producers, again, who use bacto firm or fermentation cultures. Uh, commercially, it's used to increase the drying time and you don't have to dry it to as low as 0.85. You can yep. go to uh, below 0.91. And if you're using celery juice powder, that's your replacement for nitrite or nitrate. Okay. And that's fine. And I could have changed my method rather than shut down, but I'm not going to change my method. I'm not going to change centuries old, you know, stuff in a proven, a proven environment as a, as a proven process, if you will. Um, so again, we make this now 
uh, for, I make it, I don't really make it, so people make it. It's for educational purposes and mm. personal consumption. There we go. And just as I've always said, knowledge is power. You know, knowing is after battle. Sharing is survival, and that's what this is here. Not only for a lifestyle, but like that chorizo, that's somebody's family history yeah. preserved in that stick. There could be so many stories that come out of that. You know, that Vinoy Pepe Nero, the stories of my own, as well as the many uh, uh, others who grew up doing this. I mean, I thought everybody had salami in their garages, in basements <laughs> and attics, right? You know, you start leaving your home, your neighborhood, your home, you're like, oh, what, you guys didn't do this stuff? You didn't have this stuff hanging? And, um, but anyway, so, so yeah, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity to produce it commercially, great. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's being produced commercially and it's fulfilling a need and and uh, hopefully we can extrapolate that further in some of the other things we're doing, uh, particularly in my free time um, outside of my uh, employment as a, as a protein specialist, you know, and kind of circling back around to having transcended the different aspects of industry from going from culinary school, embracing things that are from the business perspective and, uh, and whatnot. Um, but then taking it into sales. Yeah. I mean, when I had El Mondo Vecchio, I was my marketing department. I was shipping and receiving. I was, you know, doing the sell sheets, uh, yeah. putting together the presentation decks, uh, cleaning the, the pipes, uh, getting, a, <laughs> getting a drain snake stuck in, yeah. <laughs> in a floor drain. And, well, you've got a Jeep and a winch. You're yeah. <laughs> using a winch to pull the thing out. And, you know, you kind of make things happen. Right. You have to do every aspect when, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you're starting out. Like yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. So. I was trying to save some for the flight home there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, and then this last one here. Uh, this is a span. Uh, this is from this one is, of your students, right? Yeah, a, yeah. a former student, good friend, a veteran, veteran owned, a disabled vet, and his uh, and his mom. They had Rosa Linda's Mexican Cafe uh, in in what was called Northside Denver. Uh, they contributed a lot to the community, but uh, they had the restaurant for thirty six years, and then ultimately uh, closed it and. Uh, during COVID, uh, Oscar asked me, he says, hey, remember, I always talked about the chorizo and my mom, she's like, I want to dry it. Like, like, you know, it's what yeah. inspired me. So let's try it dry. So after we form it, reformulated it for commercial production um, to make it co-packer friendly, right. um, where there's things you do in a restaurant that don't quite translate into the co-packer world. So you have to adapt, you know, deconstruct the formula and then rebuild it. And we hit it right. I mean, ultimately, Ma, if mom didn't get the thumbs up, then it wasn't yeah. going anywhere. But the first run out, we nailed it. And and he says, I want to dry it. I've always wanted to dry it. So we tried drying it. And this is the result. It has that real Spanish uh, chorizo yes. kind of feel. The yes, crumbly spice to it, too. Yeah. But it's it's more that Mexican background yeah. and, and what's really neat for for oscar and, and whatnot north side was very much like shrewsbury street in in worcester mass for me it was um a lot of italians and latinos it wasn't it was a different latino in in the Ameri you know in the northeast than it was out in denver but it was still the same you know and so you'll find that there might be a hint of fennel in there that's because the the north side was predominantly Italians and, and Latinos, Mexicans in particular. Um, so beyond just this being somebody's mother's recipe who was actually somebody's aunt's recipe at one time, you know, and seeing the enjoyment of them bringing the fresh sausage to, to fruition and selling that. They're doing some salsas they used to make. He's looking at doing like tamales maybe and selling yeah. those as well um, and making this. You know, for personal consumption, this isn't commercially produced yet. We'll start doing this at um, at uh, 1860. Okay. Um, we're going to start doing some test batches of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, again, since, I mean, I only have so much free time. And I know <laughs> I know my, my limits and all that. But there's things that, with Salumi OG in particular, you know, the pre-blends. Yeah. And this is, so this goes beyond the restaurant. You know, what, what I do is I provide education, knowledge, and, and share so that other people can produce these types of things. Um, but now, and we've been testing this, and like I said, the guanciale and the pork lomo is the test runs that we've been working on for a couple of years now of being able to produce this in your home yeah, safely. Mm -hmm. You know, with pre-measured, pre-weighed, proven processes. 
Well, send me and Andrew you know? uh, some of that. We'll definitely uh, yeah. do a test no. run. At no, the absolutely. Yeah, we'll <laughs> right have there. some different BMW. things. Yeah. I'll um, drive down to College Station if I need to. Yeah, yeah. no, right <laughs> now there, there's stuff in College Station that is, they always have rotational batches. I'll be down there in October doing a whole slew of different things. We'll be down there in October. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, but the, 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 uh, the OG pre-blend program is really what we're looking at in this and in allowing home users to kind of hang at home, yeah, you know, no Netflix required. Mm -hmm. um, but no, all kidding aside, it's it's truly professional strength. It is recreational grade pre salumi pre blends, mm -hmm. OG salumi pre blends. Um, so you open a bag. That bag is is weighed specifically to meet you know a ten pound batch say. Yeah, you add the meat. Like we can make suggestions. I don't sell meat. I'm not in selling meat business. Right. You know, I'm in selling knowledge, and that's it. I don't even, the pre-blends will kind of be on their own for, for the most part. So it'll eliminate you from that liability. You, well, no, no, not what? so much liability is that I only have so much free time. I only oh. have so much bandwidth. So, um, you know, a lot of this stuff available to home users, home consumers will come through Tay Home Foods, hmm. um, which is, it allows me to stand back from the business because I, I, oh, I, I there's you. only so much I can do uh, within what, what I'm doing now with my own career. Um, as a protein specialist yeah. and whatnot and doing something different. And, and it's not so much that I don't want to do it is I've, I've done some of these things before, and this is part of somebody's business plan that they wanted to do. So I'm just kind of providing the, the content, if you will, or the structure, um, in this instance, you know, um, coming out of a kitchen and knowing you hit a certain age and being in a kitchen eight hours, 12 hours, whatever a day, is not possible. So how does, in this instance, uh, Oscar with Tejon Foods, he's so passionate about food and so excited about food, yeah. um, but he can't stand in the kitchen every day. Mm -hmm. So his medium is what he grew up around, which was the restaurant, Rosa Linda's. So the, the fresh chorizo they made, he grew up eating that as a kid for breakfast almost yeah. every day. And now he can bring that back to the community without a restaurant. That's awesome. And from a bigger picture, it's again, it, it goes back to preserving traditions. The reason I did, did Il Mondo Vecchio in the first place was because it was a lifestyle. So a lot of the OG influence, if you will, is familial. It is the, our history, um, collectively, individually, and all that. So that's really what this is all about. Yeah. From, from a standpoint for me now, professionally, mm -hmm. uh, if I were to never make salami again, it'd be okay because I actually still do, but I don't have to be present for it. Um, I'm, I couldn't be more grateful than to be part of Johnny's program and, and, and what we do down there um, and what it'll do for his staff when they, when they grow as professional culinarians and the ability to do this. And Tradition, culture. Exactly. You know, it enhances yeah. everything. It's passing you know. it down. Yeah. It, and that's really what again, it is a huge gift yeah. is one to, to be able to do that and, and to, for people to seek you out to do that mm -hmm. and such is a, is a huge honor and teaching or education is, is something that um, you don't take lightly. Yeah. Um, Similar to how uh, Cassini Brothers started, uh, you know, back in the day, riding around in the bike and the, uh, the, uh, the wet grinders, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, there's a the stones old sharpening machine right there. Oh, yeah. um, that's a foot powered, so they used to sit right there and and push with their feet and grind knives on there, and they would walk that around. <laughs> there was a time there was horse drawn carriages, mm -hmm. and older vehicles, uh, a lot of going on, a lot of culture. Right. Yeah, right, right. yeah. You've used the word gift yeah. three, four, or five times now. Uh huh. Um, this is an amazing gift, first and foremost. So. Both of you have official culinary training. I do not. I'm a I'm a home chef. We'll call myself <laughs> that. So, um, one of the greatest gifts I've had recently, man, was spending time with both you in the kitchen yesterday. Um, that was like one of my favorite experiences. You seen my post on Instagram? Yeah. It was really. <laughs> oh, I felt like you. I was living a dream, man. I don't. Um, fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about that chuck roll, man. Yeah. I learned a oh, lot yeah. on that chuck roll yesterday. Um, yeah, the chuck roll is fun. Um, you know, and to circle back around, is it applicable in every application or practical? Yeah, right. No, no. it's not. Ex to the extent that I butchered that out and whatnot, um, 
goes to show the flexibility of it. But you as an operator, as we said, mm -hmm. do you have the time? Does the st or do you have the staff? Does the staff have the skill? To, does your demographic support doing all this, all yeah. these different cuts in house mm -hmm. versus bringing in the individual boneless short rib or chuck flap, you know, things like that. And again, it's, it's more importantly going through those motions to extrapolate, <coughs> to make, help make those decisions. Or it's a nice added benefit to bring somebody in and show somebody something. Mm -hmm. And then it also, from, from, a, from a work standpoint, I love, I just love cutting when I can, but from a work standpoint, it's that it's, it's you're not selling that, you're selling the opportunity, you're selling the thought, will this work or will it won't? You're selling the idea of making those decisions, asking the questions. Well, you want to save your costs. You could do it this way, right. um, but you're going to take on the labor. You're going to take on having to deal with the trim. And is that worth it to you yeah. As, yeah. A, as an operator? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's huge part of, again, it goes to the human side of it. I mean, sales is sales, you know, but really when you start being customer focused, customer centric, and that's what I love about working for performance foods is the ability to really, again, impact people's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you go in, you sell solutions, you know, you, you show opportunities. And again, a chuck roll, what we did, butchering it that fashion, that's like maybe, a, you know, one tenth, if that or half, <laughs> you know, 5% of what the greater industry yeah. is capable of doing. But when you simplify it, if they're doing a, a birria, Mm. Pull out this, pull out that check eye, set that aside, do something unique as a special, maybe for a little higher dollar yeah. point, and then the rest of it, yeah, just cook and shred it, or cook and portion it. But know that here's all the things that we can do to support you. So first of all, shout out Performance Food Service, right? They yes. provided the meat to us yesterday. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Chicago, so, Chicago, yeah, Chicago. Shout out Performance Food Service, phenomenal. Um, Chef Steve Zabel there uh, helped uh, coordinate you. some of that. We had the uh, Braveheart Black Angus ribeye, a chuck roll, and uh, do rock uh, pork, uh, Allegiance do rock pork. Uh, Braveheart yeah. Black Angus, right? Yeah, yeah, 100 mile radius out of central Kansas. I like it. Um, I'm a huge ribeye fan. Uh, we got to taste it, and that was very flavorful. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the flavor was on point with All that right. beef. Uh, there's a lot of consistency that goes with that. I mean, you have a 100 mile radius, you have a path proven program, which is very, uh, uh, in reference to the DNA tracking, uh, lining up with the <coughs> lineage, um, you know, the Angus uh, breed specifically, mm -hmm. and all those things um, before it gets to somebody's plate. And it's a very concentric program. It's a, a program that performance develops. Yeah. It's, this isn't a, a co-pack or a brand program in a box, this is something that they actually developed from the ground up right. in partnership with the uh, beef marketing group out of central Kansas, which has the, the feed yards and then the feed to, you know, and setting the standards. And if it doesn't meet the black Angus requirement for Braveheart, then it gets kicked out of that program, but it doesn't get wasted. It goes into another program. Like we have a choice yeah. box beef program, Surety, that's basically, you know, there's no there's no breed claims, none. Right. But basically, it is the animals that don't meet that Angus criteria yeah. that kicked out, and the fact that it's centralized. And you know, when you're 100 mile radius, you have a consistent environment, you have consistent feed. I mean, BMG does a uh, uh, like a steam press corn on site. I mean, I went there and did the tour, uh, an immersion. I think it was last year, and I remember seeing the corn press, and it basically looks like corn flakes. And I took a handful of it, ate it. I have nice marbling, just like the black tar beef. But, <laughs> you know, I'm along in my ribeye and my yeah. serratus and That's, all that fun stuff. I don't know if you heard me say that when you're like, turn around yesterday. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I, show you, I was like, yeah, mine's a little fattier than that one. <laughs> <laughs> USDA upper two thirds, yeah. fine. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's uh, it's nice. Um, I, I, you know, I've been with Performance Denver now for about two and a half years. I've been in a similar specialist position uh, before with another distribution company. Um, and then I was uh, in between that, uh, um, I took some time off. I was an independent contractor. I, I had a handful of corporate clientele, some of which I worked for before, uh, one being Nyman Ranch. I was a Midwest sales director. I used to come to Chicago a lot. Um, and then, uh, uh, spent some time on my own, uh, took some time off after 30 years in, in doing what I've done. Um, I felt that uh, I had, uh, again, as the, while it was awesome to, to uh, teach and, and do all of that stuff and focus on a career and be very successful, um, the downside was that I, I didn't put that same energy into myself 
to some degree. Um, not not saying like ah, whatever, you know. No, it was just uh, it was time to take a moment and and give to myself, and then be able to give to those even closer to me that yeah, much, that much more, yeah. um, and and not be so f- career focused heavy, and maybe not you know just maybe not come back into the industry at all. They pulled me back in. <laughs> no, it was uh, the dog side. It was really awesome. You know, I, I did a lot of independent stuff. Um, I was kind of a corporate butcher for a handful of uh, Purdue uh, uh, natural meat companies, Nyman Ranch. Who I, I had worked for. You in just for educational purposes. Yeah, yeah. Too. Either trainings or tastings or cuttings, recipe development. Um, I also had as an independent contractor, a, for lack of a better way, of saying it, an open hunting license across the U.S. and mm-hmm. Canada for, for food service and or retail sales. Um, I was, uh, and again, this was after I was a director for them and yeah. after I, I took some time, uh, uh, away to just do some things that wasn't food related, that wasn't industry related. You know, I got back into working out. I, I created a whole training program for myself based on meat cuts and things like that. Carve body, uh, carve fitness, body butchery 101, um, kind of a training program for that. Um, and really getting back to, as we were talking yeah. about, that's what. That's what I enjoyed. So I wanted to get out of food, get out of just the, and just went and whatnot. And it was good. Um, so doing that, you know, I would do butchery stuff. I'd go to food shows um, and things like that. And then I started working elsewhere. Um, and then it just brought it all back and brought it all home in a different capacity that I could serve. So I started working and made it through COVID as an independent contractor. I mean, world shut down. I was working in, in Dallas Fort Worth area yeah. with Johnny doing projects. Plus, I had sales initiatives for some of the different corporate clientele I represented. And then the world shut down. As an independent contractor, food service yeah. went away. So uh, it was like, wow, all right. Second time I've been uh, shut down by the federal <laughs> federal agent. You know, uh, no, but uh, and becoming resourceful and pivoting and doing stuff like this. You know, I picked up a project in central Arizona with a group that uh, has their own Iberico that they're raising, a Portuguese Iberico in, in north of Prescott, Prescott National Forest. They have some Kobe they're raising, and they sought me out and found me. Mm, uh, Kobe. And then reached out, and I happened to be in Wickenburg <laughs> doing a, a special assignment for uh, uh, as a chef, a chef Tornant. And um, um, so I was working on that project and a couple different things that just got me through that. It, yeah. You know, always this was always a standard, uh, a way to get through all that. So, um, well, I mean, you've definitely had a you know quite of adventure. You know, <laughs> chef being you know second generation Italian, like your upbringing, um, kind of like you've been through every phase. Uh, fine dining, yeah. Uh, you know, from catching the catching the squid as a, yeah. as a teenager, yeah. Uh, the bodybuilding, um, you know, going to Johnson and Wales, uh, you know, freelancing throughout your, your mm-hmm. career. Uh, now getting it to something that, you know, you really have passion and you, yeah. know, you really have, you know, love for. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, a, you know, a, a great story you had. And, uh, you know, it's it's obviously not finished. I'm uh, looking forward to see what you do with this right here. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely coming down there to College Station. Uh, <laughs> or if you can ship me and uh, uh-huh. do some of those little packages. Yeah, there's uh, no, so we can I try yeah, it on exactly. our own. Yeah, we don't, we don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we so, don't sell it outside the restaurant per se. That's, yeah. you know, that's not an option at this stage of the game anyway. Right. That's you know come up, we've we've set it up so that it's prepared safely in there. Yeah. In there. But uh, someday, or yeah. maybe you might want to try making your own, yeah, uh, and things like that. Um, there's an opportunity to do that. But, yeah, we, yeah. Also enjoyed the uh, you know the demo yesterday. Mm-hmm. Just uh, you know how to uh, the you know, utilize product. Yeah. Uh, that, that was my main takeaway. Just like hey, how much money can you make and get? How much yield can you get? <laughs> right. Um, so I love seeing that and just you know beef uh, ribeye chicharron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You taught us both something on that one. I was, yeah, so that was that was fun. I I enjoyed that. So yeah, the ribeye and, and menuing it out. I mean that those guys, yeah. yeah, they're really tasty. Um, How did we do the, that? What part of the? So we that was a whole. So that was a ri- whole ribeye. Um, and basically, how many ribs? With choice it? grade. So you'd have rib bones five through twelve. Okay. Okay. So seven ribs. As we you know took off the the rib rack there, you have your Texas rib, Correct. which is a Dinos. A, it's a beef baby back rib. In dinos, yeah. You know, dinos. Um, one of the things, um, you know, you can split those and get petite short ribs, as we did. And then we took off that lip fat. Those chicharrones were just lip the fat. The lip fat. Yeah. And I've, I've shown folks that, and they're the same thing. I've had, wow. Yeah. Okay, just take that. Because most people throw it out. Yeah. yeah. Or they might grind it 
But mm. then, you know, it's, it's your grinding ribeye at ribeye cost. Yeah. It, you know, mm. and yeah. And such, so you have to factor that in too. But in making use of it, and I think the chicharron is a much better use of it than grinding and cooking in a burger, in my gosh. opinion. Yeah. But what do I know? Good uh, gosh. That was, you know. yes, we took off the rib lip. Is yeah, the lip or tail fat is what mm. they call that. That that little chunk yeah, of white fat that. on the tip there that you sometimes see. And made it into pieces. Made maybe it well, half quarters. quarter inch, yeah, half yeah. inch, whatever. And the fat took care of itself, and it just threw it in a pan. Yeah. It rendered itself. Yeah. It looked like you put a bunch of grease in, yeah. Yeah. but it didn't. It was didn't. just it rendered was fat. Naturally fat, yeah. And it was crispy rib eye and tender, <laughs> and yeah. yeah. <laughs> We put that we put that sauce on it. Nominal. Yeah. And uh, you know, I and again, it, thinking about applications for different items, especially something like trim, you know, you could put those on a skewer and there's a beautiful yeah. bloody mary garnish. Gosh, that bloody you mary know? suggestion was dialed in. I don't even <laughs> drink and you had yeah. me over there like Well you can have a mocktail. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. like your, it just tomato juice. i d I'm with it, especially <laughs> if it's got those chicharron that we made on there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then the uh, pork loin, and the showing pork. the flexibility of it. And and those are simple. Those are all simple. I mean, you know, it's it's awesome to be able to do the full nose and tail carcass butcher. Yeah. And there's some, like in this city here, you've got, you know, public, the group, public and group, they're doing a lot of nose and tail butchery. And yeah. there's a lot of. I've seen you break down the lamb demo before, and it's, yeah, that, yeah. that, one's, that one's nice. It's uh, it, And again, that's a niche in our industry. There's not many folks yeah. doing that. I mean, there are, but it's a very small segment of the industry. Yeah. It's well, that can do both as well. So, I yeah. mean, because you can actually, like, you made the joke about, you know, I don't cook like a butcher. I was like, he, he can actually do the fine dining and break <laughs> down the meat. So, mm-hmm. it's just like, you yeah. know, that's like a, the utility knife right yeah. there. Right? Exactly. You don't really have, you don't no. really have many folks like that in the industry no. um, anymore. So, and that's just, I mean, that's chef. I mean, I, I'm probably, I can do pastries. I did yeah. my aunt's <laughs> wedding cake once. <laughs> they were worried about that, but it came out really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a tiramisu uh, mm-hmm. wedding cake, three tiers. Um, yeah, you know, would I would I say I'm an expert in baking pastry? No, no, that's probably one of my weaker, weaker right. areas and such. But you know, again, talking about the old classical brigade, mm-hmm. being able to to do that, you have to at yeah. least have some core knowledge in having worked intimately. I exactly. Mean, when I went to Breakers, I was in the bake shop for two weeks. Mm-hmm. I made strawberry coulis to the tune of uh, sixty to one hundred twenty gallons. Yeah, straining it twice through a chinois. Yeah. And stuff like that. Yeah, that. Chef coming by to taste the creme anglaise mm-hmm. every time. Like, oh, you know, so, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And that translates into all of this, whether yeah. it's meat and purchasing. So, like, for performance, a lot of my job is out of the office. Yeah. A lot of my job is out in the field. A lot of my job is consultative right. in a way. Um, you know, yeah, we have initiatives and things that you have to do for the job itself. But, again, the gift is, is getting in front of people and – giving people ideas, suggestions. I mean, if, if it's not all fun and fluff all the time, I mean, there's some things that happen, just whatever distribution, you know, there's just things that happen that you have to take care of and the sales rep has to take care of and such. But um, the one thing that's, you know, fulfilling for me is, and I couldn't do sales job, I, I couldn't. I, I just couldn't, that's, I, I, that's not something I'm, I'm I could never be a, a server. You know, because I couldn't, I, it's just not be a host. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. bartend. Yeah. 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 I, that's my <laughs> stage. That's, that's my, yeah. that's the stage I didn't go to Los Angeles to get on. Yeah. You know, being in, in front of students or being in front of people and, and really just providing them insights, tips, tools, suggestions to make decisions, to make educated, educated decisions for themselves to be successful. You know, when, when, when a customer, when a student is successful, that's fulfilling. When a customer is successful, that's fulfilling. And it's successful for them and it's successful for you, you know. Um, so I've always looked at, at my, my abilities and whatnot to communicate, speak. And, you know, for lack of a better way, just uh, foster a relationship that's based on trust, you know, honesty and all that. There's no smoke and mirrors. Right. You know, and things like that. There can't be. Yeah. They can't be at the level of, of some of the people and places that I've been fortunate enough to have worked with and for, um, you know, as yourself in the same, in the culinary world yeah. for that, that hotel resort level yeah. of service. It's, it's a, you know, not any less different than an independent restaurant or things like that. You know, don't get me wrong in saying what we've done is any better than, than like I said, when I was a, a cook, first, mm-hmm. third cook for, you know, Dave Corporation, feeding 600 freshmen, that was okay. just as important. What would you say, uh, you know, to an expiring, uh, you know, uh, culinary student just coming up? Because the way we, 
kind of came through or came up, I guess you could say, is, you know, going through the grunt work. Oh, you got to go to Europe and get your butt kicked. Then you got to come back and do that. Mm-hmm. But now, chef, you can just I can just watch you on YouTube and learn everything. I don't need to go to culinary school. I don't need to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I don't need to go work for this Michelin star chef. Uh, you know, like the way to move through the ranks, it, it's changed. A yeah. lot. So what would you say to like, you know, uh, a, a student coming up that wants to be a chef? What suggestion would you give? If you want to be a chef, definitely go work in the industry. And as you said, go get your butt handed to you. Um, recognize that this is the service industry. It's always been the service industry. It's in the word. Whether you have a plastic name tag or you're, you're fortunate enough, God willing, you get your name embroidered in your jacket. That's a powerful thing. Again, embroidered jacket versus plaid, there's no, that equal is, has its importance. But if you're going to do it, understand the dedication it takes, you know, um, I don't enjoy being in a kitchen at this age to cook professionally. Um, I did it, done it, been there. Um, Not that I can't, it's just something I don't desire any longer. I find more passion and enjoyment cooking at home rather than for work. Because as I said, as a young culinarian, um, I wanted to focus on my health and, and well-being in a different focused way, a disciplined way with fitness whether I was going to pursue, you know, competitive or whatever, it was something that was important to me. Right. Um, and uh, at, at some point, those things, you know, when I, I, I like doing food shows, I get excited when I do those opportunities, but to do it day in and day out, there's people who are much more passionate and, and enjoy it more. For me, if, if I'm in a kitchen working, 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 then I don't want to touch food when I go home. Yeah. And that changes what I consume and then it changes my whole attitude and, and mindset and things like that because you are what you eat to some yeah. degree. And if you're not eating nothing, then, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you, your body tells you, your body, especially as you get older, <laughs> your body speaks to you a lot louder mm. and, and in different ways. So, you know, it, it's great to be still involved with food and, and especially working with the individuals who find enjoyment and passion in the kitchen. And, and all of that. I still get to be in a kitchen, don't get me wrong, but I'm not physically slicing, dicing, and, and doing all those things I did in my early days. And, um, you know, I don't think that's a badge of honor one way or the other. It's just a simple matter of what, what you want to do and what you enjoy. Yeah. And I, I find no guilt in that. Good to you. I've, I've put my 30 years into the industry and I've hopefully <laughs> got a, a few more to go. Oh, yeah. Um, but I want to, I want to enjoy what I'm doing and I'm having a really good time. I mean, when, um, PFG came to me. I'd been working nine months for a small, uh, small family-owned, fifty-year-old uh, USDA butcher shop. I used to sell. They used to distribute my salumi, uh, Tanali's meats. He was an old OG, basically. His father opened it up, and you know, it was an Italian family, so it was like you know, really. And they gave me, you know, the opportunity to go and be in the cut room. I do seven hundred fifty to thirty-five hundred pounds in the morning. Right. So I don't know, you know, and, and yeah. I go jump on on trimming and portion cutting with a guy that his father hired back in 1972 when the guy was 18. And here he is in his 60s, still hammering it out. As the passion for it. Huge too. respect. I mean, yeah. just this level of skill and knowledge and all that. It's just, it's so, yeah. you know, to come out of working there and to back into sales, sales support as a specialist, it's a whole unique, different thing. Yeah. Um, I get to, again, impact lives. Either customers or my customers are the sales associates who, who you know, they go well above and beyond. Yeah. For, for for your clientele, as you know, as a salesperson and such. So I, in some ways, hope that what my what my service is, I guess, and what I'm delivering to my customer, be it the sales associate or the, the customer at the door, is much more than just delivery of a product to a door. It's, it's providing that extra thing that's going to be impactful in some right. way to their bottom line, ideally. And uh, the ability to do that has been great. Um, and coming in. In a position like that, uh, to do it in Denver uh, and Colorado, I'm in Wyoming and I'm in New Mexico, and uh, pretty nice. And then in my free time, I, I do other things that are relevant and bring me joy. Yeah, um, that's education and teaching. Well, I know we're uh, we're wrapping up here at the end, Chef. Uh, where can we find these? Uh, you know, your demos, your videos, like you know your um, Instagram, this, probably social media, probably because there's there's a lot. What's I mean, your handle? I, uh, which one? What do we call you? <laughs> There's Mark Mark Danitis, uh, Mark M. Danitis on uh, 
Instagram there, and then there's Salumi OG. Salumi there OG. That's <laughs> yeah. Salumi OG. That's uh, the, it's, it's the OG club, Salumi dealers. Okay. Uh, preserving traditions <laughs> On the for logo. educational purposes <laughs> and uh, professional consumption. <laughs> uh, there is Carve, uh, Carve Fitness, Body Butchery 101. Um, again, that was kind of to fulfill a passion. Mm -hmm. If anything, I'm over 50. My biggest com competitor is myself. Yeah. <laughs> and getting up every day is a blessing. Um, the ability to stay healthy and fit and all that. Uh, I don't work out there in the summer. I do river surfing and then in the fall. And river whatnot, surfing, I try and yeah. stay competitive in, in myself yeah. in, in training. Uh, and then, uh, of course, on Facebook, uh, the Salumitarium. That was uh, the artist known, formerly known as Il Mondo Vecchio. Uh, but the Salumitarium was our newsletter. Uh, that was when we were in Mondo Vecchio, and then that turned into kind of just a, a holding business page. So that's yeah. when I consultated Good deal. and whatnot. But uh, yeah, Salumitarium um, is Denco uh, Special Operations Group, which is what my business is in my free time. Person. Um, and such. Well, Chef, we, uh, you know, we definitely appreciate the time and, um, you know, the story and, uh, you know, thank you for coming through. Yeah. Thank you. Truly thank you appreciate very much. it. And especially appreciate the experience it. yesterday and looking forward to having those videos come out on yeah. our Cozini Bros Instagram page. You can uh, find us at Cozini Bros on Instagram and uh, have those videos out in the next few weeks. Right. Already. Looking awesome. forward to it, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> what are you doing today? Chicka, chicka, chicka. Grand. Grand. <laughs> you know, uh, so are we live? Yeah. Ready to rock and roll? Okay. Wow. Thanks. Uh, I can't tell you how uh, grateful I am to be here. This is uh, really uh, awesome. And uh, two of the greatest gifts in, that anybody I think can ever give is is sharing information for somebody's success in education. It's been a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this uh, crazy chef life, we call it, I guess. Maybe we'll rerun that one. Okay. Yeah. Copy. But it was fun. It okay. was fun. And I like where you're going with that. Right on. Yeah. Because those knives are freaking dialed in, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw it, I was, yeah. Let me pour They're this nice. coffee in here. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. So, um, yeah, there we go. yeah I, it's got these little weird uh, plates together. Yeah, we can put some plates together and then put the cords here so they're on Okay. All right. So, yeah, let me grab a couple more of these here. I'm going to use the restroom really quick. Yeah, that All might right. be. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, man. <laughs> He's, That's beautiful. He made a chuck, charcuterie board on a knife. On a knife. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. Let me get that, too. <laughs> so, Chef, real quick before yeah. we get back to the seriousness. Okay. Yeah. Microphone check. One, two, one, two. When I step up in the place, what is you going to do? Hip hop, you don't stop. Put a can in your hand and pop the top, yo. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, a friend of mine asked me to say some MC rhyme. So I said, this rhyme I'm about to say, the rhyme was deaf. Then it went this way. I took a test to become an MC. The man, Larry Man, became amazed at me and he put me inside his Cadillac. The chauffeur, chauffeur, the chauffeur drove off and never came back. <laughs> Dave put the record, Dave put the record down to the bone. Now nah, they got me rocking on the microphone, you see the, that's the life that I lead. And you sucking MCs who say, please, so take that move back. It's your heart attack. Ain't nothing in the world. I run everybody like coach. You love the party. In a B-boy stand, rock on the mic and make the girls want to dance. Fly like a dove. I come from up above. I'm rocking on the mic and you can call me Ron Love. Yo. <laughs> Woo. Yo. <laughs> so you need to update LinkedIn to also say Rapper. certified MC. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Maki D and I'm on the go. Once the miscalculations, I'm going to let you know that I'm a Prince of Rocks, the king of hip hop. When my mind stops and I will not stop. 